Ladies and gentlemen, we now direct your attention to Commissioner Kuhn's box, situated at the home plate side of the Reds' dugout, where the ceremonial first pitch will be thrown out by the widow of the inspirational leader of the 1961 National League champion Cincinnati Reds, Mrs. Fred Hutchinson. Patsy Hutchinson will throw out the first ball. What a lovely lady. Johnny Bench will take one more. Baseball certainly remains a big part of the Hutchinson family. Jack, the second of the three sons and one daughter, one time played in the Red System, is now the assistant director of stadium operations for the Brewers. Rick, the oldest son, a former player at Florida State, Another, right behind him, one of the Hutchinson boys. Chubb Feeney next to Patsy. Doesn't seem possible that Fred has been gone since November 12, 1964, but certainly <laughs> memorialized with the Cancer Research Center in Seattle. There go the Reds. Tony, it's amazing when you look at this field, and Marty, you've seen it so often. The rain came down, that big uh, squeegee comes out, and look how dry it is. It's Italian. You should have pronounced it. What is it called? A Zamboni? Zamboni machine. And, uh, <laughs> Joe, you and I were talking before the broadcast tonight that they have never had an official game rained out here. They had a second game of a doubleheader a few years back. They had a game stopped at the end of five innings last year, a tie game with Atlanta, but never an official date rained out since they moved in here in 1970. Fred Norman, little guy who was used in middle relief, he and Belling Billingham kind of swapped positions. He's digging it out there, boy. Get him a rake and a shovel. Tony, I know that Larry Shepard, the pitching coach, you were there visiting with him. Looks like before he starts, he's going to be like the doctor. He's going to have everything ready. You talk to Larry Shepard about Fred Norman. Right, I asked Larry about his pitching style. He's been very consistent for the Reds. We talked to him before the ball game, and here's their pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Well, uh, he has all the pitches, Tony. I think that uh, with the curveball, the screwball, the fastball, the straight change, uh, plus the fact that he has control of all his pitches, and uh, I think this is going to give them trouble. I don't know about you, Tony, but my favorite shot of this four is the one in the upper right-hand corner because I like to know what that pitcher's looking at when he starts to throw. And Norman, like a lot of them, and this shot proves it, they look down at the ground. Watch when he delivers. Well, he was looking straight ahead that time. Time before he did. That'd make me feel better as a hitter, wouldn't you? <laughs> they say he has a little bit of a problem uh, when he tries to nibble too much. If he tries to be too cute, tries to nibble on the corners, you can get behind. We heard Larry Shepard talk about his screwball, slow curve. And I think his fastball is more deceptive sometimes, Marty, than people give him credit for. It is, Tony, because of his off-speed pitches. You mentioned his screwball and his, his curveball, and, and when he gets those pitches over and they're working effectively for him, it does, his fastball is deceptively quick. Would you expect a lot of ground balls if he's got his good stuff? Absolutely, uh, Joe. And uh, Tony mentioned the fact that he has been guilty many times this season of nibbling, and it's a tremendous problem for Freddie. He can roll along maybe giving up two, three hits over maybe a six-inning span, and all of a sudden completely lose it because I know as Sparky comments, he's thinking too much out there. <laughs> Don't want you to think, want you to throw. And there's his 1975 statistics in his lifetime, 52 and 57. Fred Norman has bounced around, but here he is in the major leagues. 15th pro season, here is Juan Beniquez, who is known as a fastball first ball hitter. You might say that about most of these Red Sox. An aggressive club. Takes it high, ball one. Manager Daryl Johnson made a change in his lineup with Beniquez in left field and Yastrzemski at first base. Two balls and no strikes. Dick Stello is behind the plate. George Maloney is at first base. Satch Davidson is second. Art France is at third. Larry Burnett is in right field. Colossi is in left field. That's the umpire in alignment. Three and oh, three balls and no strikes. What makes a pitcher so good? There's Zimmer at third base. What makes a pitcher so good in one park and not so good in another? He's got a tremendous home record, doesn't he, Marty? 22 and six, lifetime, and he's been a Below 500 pitcher on the road. There's the strike. 
I don't know. I, I've seen pitches like that. You have to make you wonder as Zimmer flashes the sign. And, and I tell you, if he coaches like he usually does, this guy's hitting. Johnson, he turns him loose. Norman falls behind hitters, and that'll get you in trouble. Wants a new baseball. I love that. Now, the umpire put it in his pocket. Two pitches later, going to give him the same ball. It's going to be all right. Ah, uh, the pitchers tell me they can tell. That little seam is out of place. Oh, sure. They tell me that, too. <laughs> you believe him? I believe you. <laughs> You're sitting right next to me. They're not. <laughs> Straight away center field. Geronimo has plenty of room. One away, and it brings up Denny Doyle. Joe and Marty, you've got to wonder uh, what kind of attitude the Red Sox are going into this after they lost two consecutive games, both of which they might have won. A little bit base running that may have been a little bit too risky. Well, I'll tell you, Johnny Bench wasn't that happy about the victory. He was a little bit upset last night. He said, we were lucky to win it, very lucky to win it. He said, we uh, made some bad plays, and I hope it woke us up. Hits his bat at strike one. No score, just underway. Denny Doyle, four for 12, hitting 310. This little guy has really done a job. The slider way outside. You got a good look at that slider as it broke quickly. He's got a from a great hometown, isn't he, Marty? What is it? Caves Creek or something? Caves Creek. Got a lot of people up here uh, in support of Denny Doyle. Joe, he's a graduate of Moorhead State University, and a lot of his old college chums are here at Riverfront Stadium tonight to see him play. You figure Caves Creek is uh, they turned down the stop and go light and they're all here? <laughs> One of my favorite towns. There's a pitch. He didn't have a good cut at that ball. Looked like he was fooled on that pitch by Norman. Two balls and two strikes, one out. Marty, what kind of fielder is uh, Freddie Norman? He's not a bad fielder, Tony. He's done a pretty good job this season. Fielded some, uh, did some fine fielding plays, turned in some fine fielding plays against Pittsburgh in his last start in the league championship series. 2-2 two -two pitch. Morgan. Two outs. I like the way he shakes off a pitch. He really sneers it off. You know, he gives you that tough upper lip. He sneers at you. Be surprised how many funny faces pitchers make. And sometimes you're down in the crotch. I used to have to laugh sometimes. They just give you, they don't mean it, you know, but they're just bearing down so much. I guess their expression depends a lot upon whom they've got to look in at. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. You really did, Tony. Here's Yastrzemski. Two for 11 in this series. Takes a fastball high. Boy, he was out here mighty early. Bus got out here about 5 o'clock. He had taken a cab an hour or so earlier. They're ready. Good cut of the fastball. One ball, one strike. There's the on deck hitter, and he'll get quite a reception when he comes up. Carlton Fisk. They look like they're playing Yastrzemski over more to pull toward the right field line than they did before. I guess they're going to try and pitch him inside or maybe some breaking balls. There's a good shot of it. You can always gauge it by the center fielder. Geronimo's in right center, and look at Concepcion, the shortstop. Hit it to right field. It's a base hit. Got a curveball up, and he just kind of stroked it oh so gently. Yastrzemski is on. And that brings up Carlton Fisk. Well, I'll tell you, if I'd have been catching, I believe I'd have made the same kind of a beef. Because I, I only changed my mind after watching the replay about 18 times today. Not too bad. I thought it'd be worse than it is, Marty. These fans didn't give it to him too badly. No, they really didn't, Joe, and it was somewhat surprising, but I guess the biggest reason was the fact that uh, 
it was a play that had the Reds ultimately coming out on top in the ball game, but he really put up quite a storm at home plate. Carlton Fisk. There's his strike. He's two for nine. One home run, three runs batted in. He's been a good hitter for the Red Sox in this series. He got it going last night. Tremendous home run. One and one. Mrs. Fisk. She just keeps up that applause. <laughs> ah, the lonely life of the pretty wives. Come on, Pudge. Curveball is the beauty. He dropped the curveball in there off speed. And there is Larry Barnett, who was involved in the play last night. He's along the right field line. He was behind the plate last night. Out on strike. Fisk on a screwball. So the Red Sox do not score on the top of the first. We go to the bottom half. No score. And there he is, Luis Tiant. And Mrs. Tian, what in the world is that? <laughs> Man, she came prepared, didn't she? <laughs> Beautiful. Fans are, are going to have some fun watching Louis pitch here tonight. Oh, I tell you, he is something to watch. We warn you ahead, there'll be nothing wrong with your fine tuning knob. He'll be out of focus. <laughs> here he comes. Fastball is a strike. You remember he threw a slow curveball to Pete Rose that had him. Kind of talking to himself. Makes you wonder if he'll be up there looking for it. Three for 12 in the series. No score. One and one. Rose hit the ball hard off him up in Boston. He had three balls on the nose. There's that slow oh, curve. He's waiting for he it. He was waiting for it. Yes, sir. And still couldn't oh, do look much at with it. <laughs> He's talking to himself. Joe, you talk about Tiot's motion in relation to Pete. Tony made the comment about the three hard hit balls. Pete said that Louis Tiot's head could roll off toward the first base foul line as he delivered to the plate. He wouldn't even notice it. I'll tell you, he is something. One two pitch. Fastball, and he had to fight it off. He comes from over the top. He gets a little extra on it, it seems. The thing about him, he's got six different pitches. He throws a knuckleball when he's really ahead, but it's not only the pitches that he has, it's the angle from which they come. Outside, two and two. Two balls, two strikes on Pete Rose. No score, bottom of the first. Game four. Ball three, breaking ball. Three balls, two strikes. Tian has been outstanding in five of his last six starts. His last six starts, he's allowed five earned runs in 48 and two thirds inning. That's an earned run average of 0 0.92. Amazing. Payoff pick. Pretty good fastball. He's going to need it tonight. He usually has pretty good control, too. He can spot the ball with all of his pitches. He walks two or three a game. Look at those statistics, Tony. 27 hits, six runs, five runs, three shutouts. Boy. Look at that bottom line. Oh. They pay off on. Up the middle. It's a base hit. Tiant, because of his follow through, was not ready, and it got through there. This telecast is presented by Authority of Major League Baseball is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Major League Baseball has the right of approval of the announcers for this event. Joe, you might take a close look at Pete Rose here as Ken Griffey steps in. Sparky Anderson made the comment earlier tonight that something may be going if he gets on initially. Well, he's on. Not too big a lead. There he goes. Left center field. That's going to pluck the gap. Rose will score easily. Here he comes. 
There goes Trippy the third. They're going to have a shot at him. In time, they got him. Once again, the Boston Red Sox with fundamentally sound basic baseball. Hitting the cutoff man who got the ball in good shape. Fine relay throw as we look at Lynn all the way over left center to Rick Burleson, the cutoff man. Look at Art France, the third base umpire. He's eating dust right along with Petroselli and Griffey. Good relay. Great execution, Joe. That was just perfect, boy. That's page 10 of the Spalding Guide if you want to know how you make relay plays. Lynn gave it to Burleson. Burleson a one-hopper, which is an easy ball for the infield and the handle. And Bongo, they got the man. Pedro scores. It's one nothing. Here is Joe Morgan. Hit and run play. Marty, you hit it right on the head. You said something would happen. It didn't take long. Ball one. Wrinkle those socks. Two balls, no strikes. A single by Rose and a double by Griffey, and it's one nothing Cincinnati. All three. Three nothing pitch. Strike is called. Burleson, the shortstop, really over towards the back. A lot of room between Burleson and Petroselli. Look at that. Man, he dropped two, three. You. Now we'll see it. What do you think, Tony? Well, let's hear what Joe Morgan says. We uh, had a little audio tape or videotape with him before the game. We asked him, what about Luis Tion's move? Let's hear what little Joe's got to say about Luis Tion. Well, Tony, Louie has a quick move at first, which is a legitimate move, and he also has a balk move at first. And he interchanges the two, and I think it throws the umpires off a little bit. His balk move, he starts his throw to first base without stepping, and on his regular move, he does step. What a lead Joe's got. He's got a big lead as Perez waits. They throw it oh. back. He just made it. Dropped the ball. You can tell the big lead because Morgan can get at least one foot on the artificial surface. That's the yardstick. Pete Rose, when he broke, did not have, he was in the dirt area. But watch Morgan. If you can get to the artificial surface, you got yourself a good lead. There he goes measuring again. Back there. He, he read that pretty good. That wasn't as close. Morgan's come out and said that he's not going to be thrown out anymore the rest of this series. Tian jiggles, comes from different positions, and look at the lead. Man, we got some battle going here now. Say what you want, and Perez has to wait. Morgan continues to defy Tiant by getting a big lead. Tiant challenging him. Cat and mouse. Holding. Foul back. Boy, I guarantee you now, when you look in the box score, all that happened there was a foul ball, but you never saw a more exciting moment than the Tiant trying to get the basketball Morgan. right down the middle, and that's the benefit that a bench or a Tony Perez get when Morgan's on base. Not many breaking balls. Lack of concentration by the pitcher going home. You see some balls pop in the situation. I think what they do, they rely more on throwing strikes than throwing outside corner strikes. Here we go again. Look at Morgan's lead on that surface. One strike. Pitch out. Nothing happening. Morgan says he loves it. He said he can read pitch outs. That man goes quicker to home. That's all he needs. He, does, he stops his tracks, doesn't even break. He didn't break at all. But look out now. Holding. Bouncing ball. Burleson's only play at first base. In time. 
Nice play by Yastrzemski at first base. George Malone in the umpire. A double call to make sure that everybody knew he was out. Burleson made a good play on that ball. He did throw it off balance. Couldn't get much on it as he was going a little bit away from first base. Johnny Bench with the score one nothing Cincinnati. Single by Rose, double by Griffey, and that snapped Tian's streak of no earned runs in his last 27 innings. Johnny Bench, three for 12 in the World Series. They won't give him too much to hit with first base open. High ball one. The on deck batter is George Foster, a good hitter, but not the threat to hit one out of here that Johnny Bench is. There you see Foster. Morgan just kind of cruising around second base. Boy, that's when he's the most dangerous. One and one. Perez and Bench have had a couple of pretty good swings, just missing. That's been said a lot in this game, hasn't he? Just missed it. Just didn't get it all. More often than I just got it. I tell you, man, they really play it deep. Look at Burleson, the shortstop, way back there. He may have to hit a relay, man, to get it to first. High fastball. Got to believe John White in the strike zone tried to drive that run, and that was not a good strike. It was a good pitch by Tian. Marty, how much did that shoulder injury bother Johnny Bench during the course of the year? Tony, it bothered him a lot more than he let people think it did. Uh, actually, at one point, it got so bad that he had to go to Sparky Anderson and said, look, I've got to sit down for a while and give it rest. He had a number of shots to try to alleviate the problem. One, two pitch. Hi. Right. Two and two, two outs, one run in. We're in the bottom of the first. Tian hasn't given that whirling dervish kind of move where he kicks his leg at base runner Morgan in second base. But do for it. Way back there, right center field, slow curveball, and it drops for the extra base. Morgan scores easily, Bench has a double. That ball seemed to hang up there a long time. And Evans and Lim gave it a chase. Couldn't seem to catch up with it. Two nothing Cincinnati. Well, he said up in Fenway that they wouldn't be able to play as shallow as Mr. and Mrs. Johnny Bench in the stands. Here's Freddie Lynn. He and Evans have not moved back too much since coming over from Fenway, but they got hurt by Pete Rose yesterday. This ball hung up as you said, Joe, but they were playing relatively shallow. Couldn't get to it. What a great shot from center field to see the action of the outfielders. I think there was more indecision in misjudging it. What great hitting by Bench, too. An off-speed pitch. You expect him to pull it, maybe even foul, but he was going the other way all the way. Here is George Foster now. 2 nothing ball game. Cincinnati out in front. Strike one, breaking ball. A lot of room in the outfield here, and Johnny Bench took the pitch to the opposite field. He has given the Cincinnati Reds their second run in this inning. Fastball inside. One ball, one strike. Look like they want to take the fastball and lay for the off-speed stuff. And go the other way with it. Mm -hmm. You know, Rose got the first off-speed pitch he got. He went for it. Bench hit it. Perez went after it. Dribbled it. Perez dribbled it. Field. One, one pitch. Curveball is a beauty. Overhand curveball. Johnny Bench at second base. Two runs in, we're in the bottom of the first. Tian.
Good fastball. Got it up and in. Two balls, two strikes. They're very shifted way over for Foster. Yastrzemski at first base way wide of the bag as Concepcion waits. There's a good shot of defense. Look at Yastrzemski how far he is in the bag. Two-two pitch. Calls it back. Never forget the All-Star game in Washington. Here, Bill Dickey was president, great Hall of Famer, and he was talking about Bench. He said he had seen him on television. He, was, he just raved about the strength he had and still had the great soft hands, his agility. He said, well, everybody knows it by now. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame. This is one of the first years Bench was in the majors. He may be in the Hall of Fame while he's still playing. Mm -hmm. Way outside, three and two. I tell you, it's, it's guys like Bench and Morgan and... Well, Yastrzemski, even Fred Lynn, Jim Rice, who answered the question, are the ball players of today as good as the ball players of your time? Listen, if you could play, you can play in 1776 or 1976. If you can't play, better hope your father buys the team. Here's the payoff pitch. Deonta Foster. Hot smash to Petroselli, but he was right there guarding the line. Stremski, nice play, almost pulled him off the bag. At the end of an inning, Cincinnati 2, Boston nothing. Split screen as we see Sparky Anderson on the left, Daryl Johnson on your right. Sparky's very superstitious. He always has Alex Grammas to his right when the opposition is batting. To his left, I'm sure, is George Sugar. Daryl Johnson is kind of sitting there. Two contrasting personalities managing these teams. Sparky's bubbling all the time, willing to talk to anybody, and Daryl Johnson not rude, but he's been kind of short with his answers. Simple yeses and noes. Although I guess you said more than yes or no yesterday in that 10th inning. <laughs> I kind of think he did, Tony. Here's Fred Lynn, 3 for 11 in the series. Against Fred Norman, Red Sox trail 2 nothing, top of the second. Ball one. Lynn trying to draw Pete Rose in. Petroselli, who has really been a hot hitter. Petroselli, six base hits. Petroselli and Burleson tied for the Red Sox lead in hits. There's a the strike. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. One one pitch. Look at that bench. He scooped that up like picking cherries. Watch, watch him just grab that ball like it's a tweezer, a giant tweezer. Hello there. He's got a magnet in that glove, Tony. Isn't that something? When a catcher does that, the pitcher never looks wild. Down the left field line, maybe playable. It's near the stands and into the stands. You know, some catchers will make a pitcher look wild. They're jumping around and moving. Bench. Nobody just, ever looks wild. He's the kind of guy you want to say, well, he can do it all. And then you say, well, he doesn't run too well. But then you look at what he's done, 12 of 12. And he's an excellent base runner. I think the best yardstick you can use on the franchise, and that's what he is, is that when a young catcher comes up, and I hear it so often, he's a young Johnny Bench. And then you look at Johnny Bench, the young catcher's older than him. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. <laughs> 2-2 two, two pitch. How many times have you heard it? Young guy comes up yeah. and says, oh, this guy's a young Johnny Bench. He's 28. Bench is 26. Three balls, two strikes on Fred Lynn. They're going to be saying the same thing about Lynn. High curveball. He chased it, missed it. Strike three. And that's the second strikeout for Norman. Two in a row. Rico Petroselli. Petroselli is 6 for 11. Three runs batted in. Fisk and Fetricelli have a club lead in RBIs. There's one right there. He just struck out Lynn. The ball is passed around the infield. He changed balls. Superstition, Marty? Yeah, he does that quite a bit during the course of the game, Tony. What does he figure? Some uh, witch doctor? One of those idiosyncrasies of a left-hander, Joe. <laughs> You put it nicely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the high rent district way of saying they're flaky, huh? Yeah. He's bearing down. Look, oh, I love the way, oh, man, he sneers. 
That's a broken bat, base hit for Petroselli, and in my book, there's no such thing as a cheap hit. They're all too tough to get, and Petroselli now has his seventh base hit of the World Series. Might have been a screwball that Rico got off the end of the bat. Looked like pretty good location. That's the pitch he used to get Rico out very easily when he was a big slugger. Kept the ball away. Now he goes the opposite way at times of that pitch. He did hit that ball right on the end of the bat. You could see it. Here is Dwight Evans, who was a hero for a couple of minutes last night. Hit a big home run to tie it up. Evans is three for ten. One man out, two nothing. Cincinnati leading top of the second. Fastball. Bench wanted to know where it was. And there is Rick Burleson. He's one of those bear down guys in the on deck circle. Takes his stance and tries to time the pitcher. Bouncing ball of Concepcion to Morgan one. That's all they're going to get. Evans can run. Two outs. Rick Burleson is a batter. Joe, I think uh, what tells a little bit of the story, the kind of competitor that Freddie Norman is, he was peeved when he was passed up for the second game up in Boston. I know a lot of left-handed pitchers. Uh, what a pass up, Fenway Park, Boston. That's one of those parks that left-handers get bad backs, isn't it? Ooh. Ten hits and 20 times at bat. That's pretty good in the postseason play uh, games. Burleson, first pitch once again. This time it's Rose who comes over and makes the play. Trying to say Concepcion, but Pete Rose covered a lot of ground. And the inning, we go to the bottom. Of, here it comes. We talked about on the play he made this way yesterday going to his left. He considers this his best play. What an adjustment he's had to make and do it well and never lost his hitting either. So it's 2 nothing as we go in the bottom half of the second inning. Cincinnati in front. Dave Concepcion leads it off against Luis Tian. That was a tough first inning for Tian. Made 28 pitches at the plate. Three more pitches at first base when Morgan was on. That's a lot of pitches for him. Fastball is a strike. Concepcion had some problems with Tian in Boston. Then who didn't? He won that game 6 nothing. Strike two. Headlines in Venezuela this morning. For, I understand with the front page, Concepcion's picture full page. Concepcion, the hero of the game. He's something. It's the way it should be. Hot smash to Petroselli. Played him perfectly. One up, one down. Petroselli has been as steady a ball player as you want. He's hitting, he's fielding, getting on base, and just kind of doing it in a quiet, positive way. Still insists he might quit and call this his last year. Boy, you would hate to see that happen with the kind of a series he's having. Here's Geronimo, two for eight, hit a big home run last night. Basketball misses. Another one of those oddities in this series. The small ballpark, two games, no home runs. Last night they were flying out of here, six of them. Big ballpark. There's that slow curve, hit off the end of the bat. Doyle. So Geronimo is out. What would you do, Tony, if you were batting against a guy like Tian as you watch it? I think I might do what Cincinnati's trying to do. They're taking the fastball and going after the off-speed spin. Look at Louie, another change-up curveball. Geronimo was looking for an off-speed pitch, but he still hit it on the end of the bat. That pitch, he seemed to swing it. One of those frozen shoulder jobs. Of course, he looked seven different directions before he threw it, too, which can be a little distracting. Here is Norman, not a bad hitter. Louie tells a great story on his dad, the former great left-handed Cuban pitcher. There's Rose pitching in the polo grounds. He apparently had a great fastball and also a great move to first base. And he threw over to first base. The hitter swung and missed. Threw his bat down in disgust. Told the umpire, I never saw the ball. And then, now listen to this. I was Wait listening to a ball minute. player's excuse. He reconsidered and said, I thought I got a piece of it. Deion <laughs> <laughs> plays. It's a true story. He threw the first. He, the, the guy swung, swung and went back to the bench and said, Louis, I thought I got a piece of it. He said, I got a piece of it. Louis claims it's true. Left field. 
Venikas is where he makes the play. I'm going to have to ask Satchel Page about that. That sounds like his kind of story. So at the end of two, Cincinnati two, Boston nothing. We'll be back here for game number five tomorrow night of the 1975 World Series. Joe Garagiola's baseball world will be on, and you've got Max Patkin. He's Max been in every Patkin. park in the world. That's right. You know, he's the last of his breed, which it all began, at least in my memory, with Al Shack as the clown prince. And Max, who does a very physical show, we went to Rochester, filmed him, and I think you'll enjoy it. I don't think there's going to be any more after Max. Here is Tian to lead it off. We're in the third inning. Curveball, and they're treating him with respect, and they should because it was Tian as Benica swings that bat in the on deck circle. Tian got himself a base hit when he were at Fenway. And it's ball two. He almost missed, he did miss home plate as he came around and he went back and tagged it. Two balls and no strikes. Ball three. I tell you, it's easy to see why they would love this fella, especially in Boston. You've got to like him. He's a bear down guy, gives you everything he's got. 3 0 pitch. Ball four draws the walk. And that'll send Sparky Anderson to the water cooler, I guarantee you. That'll make you stir at least. Hiroshi used to always go to the water cooler. There he is. There's his uh, superstitious lineup. Grandma's to his right. That's Sparky Anderson with his leg crossed, which is another one of his superstitions. Sugar, the coach, has to sit up there off his left shoulder, and Larry Shepard to the right of Grammas. Sure has worked. <laughs> it sure has, especially <laughs> if you've got good hitters. There is Norman sneering off a of pitch, and Benicus hasn't taken his eyes off him. Look at the concentration on Benicus. Ball. Let's see if their eyes meet. I mean by that, after he gets the sign, if Benicus will pick him up right away, Tony. He's got it. Another one, same pitch. Two strikes. Luis Tian is the base runner at first. Here we go. Benicus with a count of strike two. Good spot. Three screw balls in a row. Benicus, as you obviously can tell by those first three pitches, respected as a fastball hitter. Tony playing behind Luis Tiana first. One two pitch now. Fouled off. Say that Cecil Cooper played behind Perez last night. No, Tony took off. And what made a difference. It. Yeah. Could have been the third out. Had he been thrown out, bench would have never come up. Everybody on this club looks for that green light, whether it's hitting or on the bases, and Sparky Anderson usually giving it. Foul ball, it's out of play. He's really spotting that ball well. He's keeping the ball the outside part of the plate. He walks about four per nine innings. Been more of a strikeout pitcher than you'd suspect a little like guy like he is would be. Strikes almost six out per nine innings. So far tonight he's got two. There's the on deck batter, Denny Doyle. Nobody out. Line over the dugout. He just again, that's that good fastball in, and that good hitter, when he can't handle it, he just fouls it off. Benique is noted to be a pretty good offensive player. They felt he'll hit around 300, pop a home run once in a while, has a chance to be a good base stealer. They're trying to find a position for him. If he can hit, they'll find one. Off the end of the bat, but it's going to sneak through. Whoa, Louis. Tian, <laughs> he made that <laughs> left turn. <laughs> Louis had some experience this year being on base. That was the first game of the World Series. 
Almost gets nipped by the ball. <laughs> You're going in the right direction, Louis. Don't round it too far at second. <laughs> Tell you, the other day in Boston, when he got on first, they gave him a jacket and a road map. Now he's looking like he's going to have got some ideas. <laughs> Throw a lasso on him. That's it. He's just one of those guys that makes things happen when he's around him. As the base hits to right field, almost hits him. He Dion. scores, yeah. ball misses home plate. Something's always happening. He's an exciting kind of guy. So it's first and second. Now here's Denny Doyle. Doyle bounced out his first time up, and they're moving in on him at first and third. They're looking for the bunt. He squares around, and then, whoops, look out there. The he Cincinnati infield was doing a little decoy in there, too. They were creeping in at the corners, and Concepcion was way over toward the back. That's where he was now. But as soon as Norman started pitching, they backed up on the left side a little bit. Remember, it was Doyle who slapped the ball by Rose in one of the ball games earlier. He's got a lot of room between Concepcion and Rose. Ball one to count. Center field, Geronimo covering over fast and makes the play. The ball was well hit, but he was very shallow. He covered a lot of ground. The kind of situation you would expect Doyle to bunt, Joe. I thought he was going to bunt all the way, but they put so much pressure at the corners on this artificial surface, didn't feel he could do it successfully. Johnson, one of those uh, managers who plays pretty conservative, but again, that uh, pressure from... Rose and Perez just took the bunt right away from him. I haven't seen that conservative play by Johnson. I think he's really well, I mean, had his guys funny. going uh, on the base pass. Yeah. The only guy he really didn't bunt with we expected was Yaz. And he said he would have bunted with him last night if he'd got one strike. Oh, he's not conservative on the bases at all. Or 3-0. and oh. Bouncing ball to Morgan. There's one. And there's two. Double play. 4-6-3. And the crowd loves it. Here's the play once again. Two nothing. Cincinnati leading. Tony, here's that double play again. You gotta love the way Morgan gives you that ball. You'll see right here why David Concepcion's son's middle name is Alexander after Alex Kramis, who spent so much time working on him with just that specific play, among many others. A lot of hours put in trying to refine his double play technique. Certainly has refined it to the point that he's got it down perfectly. Here is Rose. He singled and scored the first run. Single to center field. Hit hard, center field. Lynn is there. Boy, he jumped on the first pitch and really drilled it. Can't say he fooled him with that one. Here is Griffey. Griffey double to left center field to drive in Rose, but then was out on a tremendous play by Lynn to Burleson. To Petroselli. Ken Griffey, 318 his last 44 games. Ted Kozuski simply says he's our Ralph Gar with power. And I think that pretty well says it all. There's the strike. Joe Morgan in the on deck bat in the on deck circle. Marty, I think everybody around here feels that. Griffey has the potential to be another Joe Morgan. He's got a little bit of power. Clue says he might hit 20 home runs someday. And of course, he's got the great speed. That's right, Tony. He last year had a terrible habit of going after bad pitches, and they worked that with him on spring training, and he seemed to really cut down on that on that problem during the regular season, primarily one at good pitches, and it and it really paid off for him. He's up to now with a one-one count. What a pitch that was. I had a question for you, Joe. All right. If you had had Griffey's speed as a player, what might you have done? <laughs> probably an artificial <laughs> surface, too. Oh, that, too. You could I'd have probably, it all. I probably would have hit a hard 260. <laughs> <laughs> that way, Fox Wall in right field for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the one two pitch. A hard 260. <laughs> hard 260. <laughs> What's Any, a hard 260? <laughs> anything I hit hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> two balls and two strikes on Griffey. In addition to not being able to hit, I also couldn't run. <laughs> right back to Tian. He's got this one and over to first. You had a hard four base hits one World Series. Don't discount that. 
Uh, you can catch lightning in a bottle once in a while, Tony. Here is Morgan. Boy, I tried to figure out the pitchers that would give him the most trouble when he was on bases. You know who's at the very top of his list, not playing now? Pete Rickard. Remember Rickard? Yeah. He had a good move. Dodgers. He made it tough on Morgan. Out of play. Joe says the toughest right-hander in baseball is Andy Messersmith. And, of course, one of the top-throwing catchers is Steve Yeager, the Dodgers. And yet Joe went 13 for 13 stolen bases against the Dodgers. The moral of that story is... Don't believe a base stealer. <laughs> One strike pitch. Ooh, he had some ideas on that slow pitch. Well, Morgan simply says, nobody's going to stop me from stealing. Some make it tougher than others. There was a... Oh, I, that pitch is a tough pitch to handle. He missed the inside corner, but he shoots for the belt buckle. There's nothing you can do with it, and he really twisted and turned on that one. He took a good look at the center field bleachers. Here's a shot from behind. The pitcher, here's what it's going to look like, the outfield. You know, Tony, it's a funny thing. As a, as a catcher, all the years you spend with the ball coming towards you, but the infielders and outfielders, it's going away from you. You know what I'm saying? Makes a lot of sense so far. I know, but, I mean, it's a different <laughs> perspective, like when you sit in a ballpark. Like right now, this is where the infielder would see it. Right? Yeah. I mean, a catcher's view, it's always going to come to him, so it's, it, you're not leaning forward. I know. It's the same thing with Adam <laughs> with the catcher. It's that theory you got get it, man. Pop, pop. I can see that blank look. It's like it's a look you get when you start to blow up the footballs. I know. <laughs> that ball's well hit. But you, uh, Finiquez is out there this time and makes the play. So you see Yastrzemski, he had it covered well. Three up and three down. It's 2 nothing, Cincinnati. Top of the fourth, 2 nothing Cincinnati out in front with our handheld camera. There it is. Now, that's a spot. See, I would All sit right. there, and the reason I would sit there is so I could watch the third baseman throw the ball as opposed to sitting at first base and watch the ball come towards me. I can get you that job. I'll call Corey Leibel, the guy carting that camera around. You can have his job. I don't want his job. <laughs> Norman against Carlton Fisk. It would be easy to say right now, Joe, that Boston is down, but it's the World Series, and I know they're not. They know what they've been through this entire year with Baltimore in pursuit. No way. The only way they're down is on that scoreboard. They're trailing by two, and they're going to try to get some runs. You don't get down. You're playing in the series. Last ball is high, ball one. I'll tell you one, there is uh, Fred Lynn. I'll tell you one thing, that Rose is way back there at third base. He's going to have some trouble if he does come up with the ball. Long throw for him. Two balls, no strikes. He's had some arm problems, too. Shoulder, Marty? Well, he had some elbow problems, elbow. Tony, but he, going into the playoffs, he said they had completely cleared up for him. 3-0. and all. Norman behind. It's 2 nothing. So every time those Red Sox get a runner on, that time runs at the plate, and they got some gunners. There's the strike. Dick Stello raises that right hand and strike like he's posing for that baking soda head. Big, powerful arm up there. 3-1 pitch. Well hit, in the gap, left center field. Could be extra base, but look at Geronimo get over there and cut that ball off. Fine defensive play, and there's that raw speed like he was talking about. I'll tell you, Joe, Tony, he can do it. He is considered by many to be the best center fielder in the National League, and as you mentioned, on artificial surface, it makes it all the more difficult as you see him sweep deep into the gap in left center field to cut that ball off and really recover and get a quick throw off to the infield to keep Carlton Fisk to a long single. You could see from that outfield camera following him how far he got over in that gap. And that's what Sparky was talking about, that raw speed. Because when it hits that artificial surface, it really jumps. And here's Lynn, who was out on strikes. Strike one, foul tip. Geronimo's fun to watch from up here because you can see the ball hit the bat, and you can see his movement. 
something you can't see when you're down at ground level. You've got to watch the ball off the bat like a tennis match. But we can see it both from up here. And he's moving even on a foul ball, getting the jump. You know, he's going to get in a position sometime tonight when he's going to be right in line with our camera, and we'll be able to take a sneak preview. Way outside. He's way over now in right center field. Not way over, but he's towards the right field side of the bag. You line up according to the second base bag. It's one ball and one strike, two nothing. Whoops, little flip throw. Nobody out. Two nothing. Cincinnati leading. Going for that outside corner. Strike. One ball, two strikes. You know, baseball can get very basic to the point that the team that wins is the team that stays away from the double play. There is Geronimo. Let's watch Geronimo. Right. Now, this is a ball that was not even hit by Freddie Lynn the last swing, and you can see before the ball was hit, obviously, he's going toward left center field. One two pitch on the way. Line foul. Starting to say, Tony, and you've heard it, where the managers say, if you can stay away from the double play and on defense, you've got to cut that ball off to keep it in order, and on offense, Hitting to the right side, bunting, moving the guy around. Double play, that's the real, that's the rally killer. And if you can keep it in effect when you're on defense and stay out of it when you're on offense, you've got yourself a pretty good ball club. And both these clubs are able to do that. Geronimo has just kept it going here by cutting that ball off at fist hit. Here's the one-two pitch. Outside. Whereas you can see behind fist. He'll not be going anywhere. They're looking for a big sock from young Fred Lynn. Tap foul. All those outfielders as you look at him moving. Lynn hits best when he tries to go the opposite way on left-handers. He appears to be trying to pull the ball more than anything else. Throw him some curveballs. He's been out in front on them. Here's an interesting situation now. Three balls, two strikes, nobody out. Fisk is on at first base. Lynn against a left-hander. Do you run him? Do you keep him there? That's a right-hander. I might start him against a left-hander. I'd hold him, but let's see what Daryl Johnson decides. I agree with you. He's holding. Fouls it back. Bad pitch. Might have been two men on, nobody out. That was a bad pitch. But when you got two strikes on you, you can't be that choosy. There is the first base. A look at the batter and the, the angle at first base. With Fisk at first. Perez behind him. Three and two, I like the late Clemente's theory. Any pitch you can hit is a good pitch. Fisk is holding. Hot smash, almost got Fisk, a base hit in the right field. Carlton had to stop to let the ball get by him. Lynn jumped on a high pitch and drilled it in the right field. Now it's first and second, nobody out. Here it is again. Here's Fisk coming close to getting hit by this hard smash which may or may not, if we don't know for sure, have prevented him from going to third base. He said pretty sharply, Griffey was playing toward right center. Don't think he would have taken the chance. That's a pretty good arm. Major Barbone now has gone down to the bullpen for Cincinnati to get loosened up. Barbone. Neither uh, Rose nor Perez looking for a butt with nobody out and two men on. Obviously, Barbone is a long middleman. Sparky used them all last night. Rose is way back at third. Nobody out. Petroselli with Evans, the on-deck batter. Nice play by Finch. 
He has done that throughout the whole series. Not only has he come up with it, watch him get his body in front of this ball to prevent it. Look at that. Hit him right in the middle of the chest protector. And then he plays it off the protector. Morgan comes in to say something to him. Might be a little stall for time. Barbosa throw just a few pitches down in the bullpen. A string of right-handed hitters coming up. Now you infielders go there and say, come on, settle down. I want you to settle down. You go in sometimes because the manager says go in. You don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then that pitcher runs you out of there. It's Freddie Norman, and he gives you the look he gives the catcher. <laughs> you take off. 1-0 pitch. High pop fly. Concepcion is under it. It's an infield fly. Infield fly. Petroselli is out. One away, and here is Dwight Evans. Petroselli got under that ball. Evans into a force play his first time up. At 316 in his last 48 games. He and Fisk were the two hottest hitters on this Red Sox club going through September. He's become a more aggressive hitter. At one time, he took too many pitches. Johnny Pesky has worked with him, tried to make him more aggressive. Gets by Bench this time. It'll be a wild pitch, and both runners advance. And that's a big play. As good as a bunt. Looked like a screwball. For a while, it looked like almost like he was going to hit Evans. Bench just couldn't get around. That's kind of a funny pitch because usually if it's a curveball, when it hits, it would have gone to Bench's right side because it goes in the opposite way because of the rotation. That's one of those pitches as the late and so wonderful Casey Stengel used to call a 55-foot curveball. Here comes Larry Shepard. He has Barbeau ready, but... Does he come out when they take him out? Marty's usually Sparky. No, Sparky is the man who comes out and brings a pitcher back with him, Tony. And Sparky made the comment earlier tonight that he felt like he had to have six strong innings out of Freddie Norman in this ball game. Did he give any reason, Marty? Well, he felt like he really, as you mentioned a moment ago, Joe, really went deep into his bullpen last night, and uh, he does not want to have to go deeply into it again tonight. There's Bourbon again. It's interesting. They talk about Fenway Park not having any effect on the ball game as we look at Sparky. Well, maybe they're keeping Gullet back this one extra day so he doesn't have to pitch the seventh game if it goes that far in Fenway, but they could still use him in relief to get left-handed hitters out. Red Sox forced to go with Tiant down by one. Evans waits in the pitch. Slow curveball. See Bench give uh, Carl Fisk a quick look. One ball, one strike, one out. Two nothing. We're at the top of the fourth. Cincinnati's leading. And the infield conceding one run on a ground ball. Deep to right center field. This could be trouble. Way back there. Off the wall. Two runs are going to score. Here comes Lynn. There goes Evans heading for third. There's the throw. Oh, nobody back there. Nobody backing him up. And luckily, oh, well, luckily is right. Nobody was behind him. Norman was back in the plate. They're halfway in between, it seemed like. Here it is, Geronimo, the strongest arm in the outfield, throwing the strongest arm in the infield. That's Concepcion with a relay in right center field. And Freddie Norman was hung up as Zimmer saying, whoa, wait a second, don't go and hit the screen, protecting the uh, dugouts. So there it is, all tied up at two apiece on another clutch hit by Dwight Evans. Boy, two days in a row, that big guy's come on. Now the infield has to move in. Evans is on at third base with the triple. Here's Burleson. And there's the base hit. And Boston takes the three to two lead. Burleson's trying for second and makes it. What a piece of base running. Seth Davidson says, no way. They took for granted that Burleson would stop at first base. Well, it shows the scouting report of the Red Sox. If the ball is handled by Foster, we'll take some chances. Not on Geronimo. Burleson knows that Foster fielded the ball. Sats Davidson of the National League right there. Eating dirt with Morgan and Burleson. Here's Evans on third. With the infield in the way it was, an easy base hit had they been playing back. An easy out. Here's Burleson again coming into second base. 
Offline throw by Foster. He takes a little while to get rid of the ball. But just made it. No, not only was it a bit offline, Tony, I felt that he didn't have a whole lot on it. Kind of took for granted that he was going to stop and say, oh, baby, I just drove in the tie break and run. But that's not the way the Red Sox play, and they now lead by the score of 3-2. to two. And there's a break in the action with the score of 3-2 Boston. Luis Tian has just fouled a pitch off with Burleson on its second base. Barbone, a good fastball. Burleson, don't look now, man. Seven base hits for him. Him and Petroselli. Rico, a base hit his first time up. And Tian, a base hit in the center field. Geronimo, a good arm, and Zimmer holds him up and bench now. And look at <laughs> Tian made a big turn at first base, and nobody was there because Perez was the cutoff man, and Louis goes scampering back. Really wasn't much that Rick Burleson could do. And here again, the scouting report say, not on Geronimo. All the way on the fly. First base was open. There's Perez in the cutoff position, allowing Tian to make the wide turn at first. Burleson get hurt down there at third base. Trainers out there, Charlie Moore looking at his leg. Now out comes Daryl Johnson. He may have pulled something to be out of the game. He's limping. Well, looks. He had to pull up quickly, and it may be one of those quick stops because he had all the intentions of the scoring, and you can see it's a left ankle, and sometimes when you put those brakes on a little bit too hard, you may pull something. Here's Carlson coming off second base. He thinks he's got a chance to score, and now watch Zimmer. He's got a, well, he's holding him all the way. Right there on the artificial surface. That's where it happened. May have jammed that ankle. Didn't mean to swing. Little tap. Perez can't get it. Everybody's safe. It's 4 to 2 Boston. Looked like Tony took his eye off the ball as Benitez ducked a high fastball. Barbeau makes a good pitch. Really jammed them, but Tony Perez lets it skitter under the edge of his glove. Had no chance for a play anywhere. We got a 4 to 2 game. There's Beniquez. That's a jam job. Jam city. But the Red Sox get a break. Four to two, Boston out in front, and here is Denny Doyle. It's an error on Perez. Strike. Activity in the Cincinnati bullpen as Barbone delivers a fastball outside, one and one. There is Clay Carroll, the Hawk. It would be redundant to say he was in there last night because anybody who warms up tonight, you could say that about him. That's going to be playable. Pete Rose and Bench, who's going to get it? Rose takes charge. There is Tian visiting with Morgan. You don't think he's saying that's not a balk, Joe? Come on, you're making trouble for nothing. I think he's saying, how do you like my hitting and my base running? Here's Jastrzemski, three for 13 in the World Series, the Red Sox. Four to two, this is the ninth man to bat in his fourth inning. Off the handle, a little looper coming off fast, Geronimo, and can't get it. Here comes Tiant. He's going to score. Benitez is held up. He had ideas of coming around. Cesar broke back on the ball. He looped around the ball, starting the left center field. That's what artificial service can do to a ball. Look at that hop. So the Red Sox have taken a three-run lead. It's 5-2. to two. Here's the man who got it all started, Carlton Fisk. He drilled one into the gap in left center field. It was cut off by Geronimo. Fisk has taken plenty of time to give uh, Tian a little chance to breathe here. Tian's been on base both times. He walked in the third. Now he's come around to score after he singled. There is Sparky Anderson. He's given signals to his people. Barbone. I don't know what he could be giving him unless how to pitch him. 
with the fisk up there, you don't look for your Stremski to be breaking. There's a high fastball, ball one. Big inning for the Red Sox. Five big runs. Outside. 2 0. Oh. Now, you know, that's Zimmer, very active coach. In fact, Daryl Johnson, the manager, simply says to Zimmer, go out and coach your usual game. And that means that the runners will be running. Got under it. Left center field. Concepcion Nacheronimo takes charge, makes the play. And that ends the fourth inning, a good one for Boston. Five to two in the bottom of the fourth. Red Sox out in front. Five to two, the Red Sox with five runs in the top of the fourth have taken the lead, and that's the way this series is going. And tomorrow, game five, there it is, begins with the baseball world, and you'll get a good look at the last of his breed. Max Patkin, the baseball clown, will be our show. And then if Boston should win this game, of course, we go back to Fenway Park for game six. Game seven, there's a lot of ifs, I'll tell you something, but these two clubs evenly matched, fundamentally sound, and every game has just been a real, real battle. Game five tomorrow. Game six will begin 12.30 on Saturday Eastern time should Boston win this game. And there goes Tian into some gyrations now. He gives it a little dipsy do. He starts putting it on a little bit more when he gets ahead. I'm going to see a few knuckleballs. Now he's starting to look around. He's got those hinges in his body all oiled up, and he'll start to flop around with that raggedy Ann arm of his. A real battler, this fella. Right field. Way back there it is. Man, he gave it a good chase. Foul ball. Evans playing toward Harris Power, which is right center field or left center field. He has a long run. Not much room there. He has to break himself very quickly. You can see the padding to prevent any injuries in that corner. He came a long way. Not much room down in those corners. Burleson's playing short left field for Paris. Did you see that move? <laughs> he turned completely to home plate, looked at direct center field. Watch this. If you're sitting in center field, you got to see his eyeballs. Look at that. Well, one other man I know who can do what we saw in that last replay of Tion. Who? Oh. You've got him on your show tomorrow. Max Patkin, <laughs> that's right. Oh. You know, and it's calculated. It just doesn't happen. This man figures it out. Here's a 3-2 pitch. Struck him out. Foul tip held on to by Carlton Fist. That's the first strikeout. Fisk held on to the foul tip, and that's a play you just can't practice. You're lucky. One of the few plays in baseball you can't say, I'm going to go out and practice foul tips. Why are some better than others? I always felt that Yogi was good at catching foul tips. It has to be a loose webbing in the glove, and he's lucky. How can you go out and practice it? You go up and tell a coach you're going to practice foul tips. You know what he does? He'll take your temperature. It's like going out and practicing triple plays. I never understood how Yogi could do it with the pause he had. Those little nubs, huh? Oh. Johnny Bench, high curveball. I love when he put down those signals. He indicated three fingers, and he had that little stub look like two and a half. I wonder what kind of pitch is a two and a half pitch? Tiant. To bench. He missed outside. Marty, I'm trying to recall the number. Maybe you can. And it's a high amount of games in which the Reds have come back in the late innings to win ball games. Around 39 games, Tony, during the season. It's a lot. Fastball taken. Fisk, the low target. Oh, what a pitch that was. Right on the outside corner. Johnny Bench thought it was low. And I'll tell you, he is really upset. Look at it. Carlton did a nice job of oh. snatching the ball in a couple of inches. And he gave the umpire a good look. And John gave him a good speech. Fouls it back. 
I don't think you fool too many umpires these days by snatching the ball back in, do you? I don't think so either, Tony, except that when you you don't make your pitcher look wild, bench does it, fist does it so well, you get some of those. Left field, Benitez moves his cap but makes the play. Two away. Foster, who bounced out his first time up. You know, you, you watch the catchers move back there, and again, they give the umpire a good look because if you catch the ball coming down with the big glove, the umpire can't really see where you caught the ball. He sees the glove over the corner of the plate, and many times that's a factor. Drill foul. difference sometimes in, in the strike and a ball is if you catch the ball in the webbing or if you catch it in the heel it could be maybe six eight inches in there and if you got the glove coming down or closed off the umpire we really has to make a guess at it one ball and one strike Luis Tian five to two the Red Sox are leading they got five big runs in the fourth inning How do you like that? Shook off the pitch in the middle of his windup. Two balls in one strike. As he was delivering the ball, he was shaking off the pitch. You gotta like this guy. Luis Tian. High curveball, wants a new ball. He hasn't been back to Cuba in some 16 years. He said he would like to go. Everybody knows by now his parents are here and they've seen him pitch great baseball through the month of September championship series and the first game of the series up in Boston. He knows how to pitch. Listen, his father knows how to pick off guys too, I'll tell you that. If his father still got to move, I'd like to use him on the baseball <laughs> world. Throw to first base and have the guy swing at it. 3-1 pitch, fouled off. You concentrate so hard on Tiant and his head fakes and the different deliveries, you forget how well he spots the ball when he has his control. He's settled down a little bit more now as the game has progressed, and he's been hitting the corners. You can see Fisk set up, motion outside. He puts the glove down, and Tiant's close to it. Let's watch Fisk. Off the handle. Doyle backhands it. Long throw. Not in time. That one went in the And dugout. it goes into the dugout. That throw into the dugout. Boston running and hit the fence. Here's Doyle showing some good rage. He didn't have time to ride himself to get good balance. Not much on the throw, but he did get a, have a good job getting the ball away. Yes, might have left the ball, uh, the bag, a little bit sooner so he could have stopped the ball from going through. Yes, he was going to get his man. Foster hits a quiet 300, doesn't he, Marty? Just a steady 300. He really does, Joe. And, uh, of course, they talk about this season for Cincinnati. The big key when they talk about it will be the movement of Pete Rose to third and Foster to left field that really turned this team around. That was the move that kicked the big red machine in the gear. And here is Concepcion. Two men out, 5-2 Boston leading. We're in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Good fastball. That's the best fastball he's thrown, Tony. Burleson was telling me before the ball game that he played against Concepcion several years ago in Venezuela in the Winter Leagues. And he said he never thought that Concepcion would hit. He stood so far away from the plate, held a bat on the end, and couldn't reach pitches outside part of the plate. But Big Clue got a hold of him, and look what he's made of. Really a, well, it's a tremendous shortstop. Hopped up. Going out, Burleson coming in, Lynn could be triple, and it's up. Foster scores, and it's a two-base hit for Concepcion. There's no reason for that ball dropping. It was a tough play for anybody who had to make it. Lynn usually comes and gets these kinds of balls near collision. This is what happens when you get out of Fenway on this artificial surface, just a shade deeper, and he couldn't get it. Nobody seemed to take charge on that play. They were all reaching, much like the, the same feeling you get trying to look for the light switch in the dark. Everybody was just reaching. 
when you go out as a shortstop, you're looking at the ball and you're just waiting for somebody to crunch you. And that's the way it looked, Tony, and Burleson just kind of felt his way there and cost him a run, 5-3. Here's Geronimo. Strike one. Tiant made a good pitch. Concepcion hit the ball off the end of the bat. It was a little pop fly. And the three of them surrounded it. There's some action in the Cincinnati bullpen once again. There he is, the Hawk. Strike two. This crowd is coming alive here. It's five to three now. Concepcion has hit two balls, and it really, really stung the Red Sox. He hit that five bouncer that tied it up, the one that got the grub worms in Fenway, and now this one, that little blooper. Two strikes to count, Geronimo waiting. Just missed outside. Activity. Burton is the left-hander. Pole is the right-hander. Or Bones in the on-deck circle, but I'm sure if he gets on, we're going to see somebody come to the play, a pinch hitter. Crowley's been so good off the bench for Sparky. Here's a one-two pitch. Nice block by Carlton Fisk. Two balls and two strikes. That curveball broke low. Blocked it nicely. Now he's got a nice low target, just like Bench. Look at him block that ball and keep it there. I'll tell you, I said it so many times so far in this series, this is only game four. If you're a young catcher, you can follow either one of these fellas behind the plate. Really learn a lot. I'll it back. Good fastball. You know, Joe, these two guys, you can talk more about catching than I can, obviously. These two guys prove that there's more to catching than they're just putting down fingers and throwing to second base. Oh. Well, that's the thing when you go into talk contract. It's working the pitchers. It's blocking balls. It's blocking the plate. There's Concepcion at second base. Tian. 5-3 Red Sox lead. Bottom of the fourth. A little looper down the left field line. Benique is coming over. Can't get it. It gets by him. It'll be extra bases. Two for Geronimo. He's heading for third. Here's the throw. It is not in time. So I've got to wonder if Juan Benitez, who looked like he got a good jump, had some trouble with the lights. He, he started after the ball very well, and then he just shied away from it. You see again what happens in artificial surface as opposed to a grass field. Here's the play on the relay from Burleson to Petroselli. I believe we're going to have a pinch hitter now for the Reds. Look at that Cincinnati bench. It's five to four, and Crowley has come out in the on-deck circle. Sepsione, Foster walking by. Tiant, I tell you, a tough luck pitcher in this inning. He got the first two men easily, and then Foster hit a bouncing ball. Doyle came up with it. It was an infield hit. Foster went to second as the ball got past Ustremski, an error on Doyle. And then Concepcion, a bloop double, three outfielders converged, let it drop, and then Geronimo hit one off his handle down the left field line. And Tian now faces Crowley. Five, four. four. And Geronimo will lead. Now time is called. Hey, they're, they're going to appeal, appeal it. Safe. They appeal. They had to put the ball back in play by stepping on the pitcher's rubber, then stepping out. And the second base up by our Sats Davidson says, uh-uh. It was a good uh, good attempt on the part of Boston because Geronimo at second base did stumble as he was watching Benicas run the ball down. Good swing by Crowley. There's Geronimo. This is his first appearance. Played in his 1973 series for Baltimore. 0 for 1 is a pinch hitter. 
Hi, one and one. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. One ball, one strike. Crowley, a pinch hitter for Bourbon. Strike is called a fastball. Tiant trying to pitch out of it. Leads by a run. Tying run is the third. Geronimo. Let's see where Fisk spots it. Struck him out. Decoyed inside. Went to the outside corner. That ends it. But at the end of four, it's Boston five, Cincinnati four. The preceding announcement was furnished by Major League Baseball. Great shot is tremendous ballpark here. Riverfront Stadium as Clay Carroll comes on. Seven and five. Hard thrower. This guy rears back and pumps, Marty. Sure does, Joe. He's got the basic pitches, fastball, slider, curveball, and set a new record this season for the most appearances ever by a Cincinnati Reds pitcher. Lynn jumps on the first pitch as an easy out. He broke Nuxie's record, didn't he? Joe Nuxhall? Sure did. Broadcast with you during the regular season. Still pitches batting practice almost every day. This is Carroll's third game this series. His 12th in World Series appearances. Enrico Petroselli, 18.8 home runs. Pretty good. Foul ball out of play. Rico was going for one. He tried to put a little charge into that one. Clay Carroll, strike two. And there is Evans. What a clutch hitter he's been. One ball, two strikes. Carroll against Petroselli. Two hits in each of his first three games. He's got one hit tonight. Petroselli out on strikes. Cut the outside corner. Although it didn't show in yesterday's ball game, the Reds just keep throwing quality pitchers at you out of the pen, and that's been a big plus for them all year long. Here is Dwight Evans, who hit into a force play, and then triple in the fourth inning, a big triple. Drove in two runs. Four for 12 in a series. Drilled it off Carroll in the right field. Carroll, although hit, goes over to first base. Hit right back at him. Bench calls time. He's going to check with the Hawk. The Hawk is stalking back to the mound. He doesn't even want to rub. He, he knows his Sparky will take him out. I'm all right. He got jolted pretty good. Couldn't see exactly where it hit him. He's not going to tell anybody yet. He wants to give me the ball. I want to pitch. That's all. Evans tried to say something to him as he was over at first base to say, how are you? There's Larry Starr, the trainer. I tell you, how <laughs> many is... guys have gotten that bullpen to him? It's got to be a factor, and this guy's a real battler anyhow. Joe, I'll tell you, this guy does not want to come out of the game. In fact, last night when Sparky took him out, he went into the dugout, threw his glove up against the wall, and pretty much made it known that he was not happy at all with it. Let's look again. We can see where the ball hits Clay Carroll. The vicious line drive looked like a sinker, and you can see what a pitcher has. Absolutely no chance at all. Where'd that hit him? Hit him right in the La Panza, right in the boiler. <laughs> the hole. Right in the <laughs> boiler. That is chronic heartburn where he got hit. Oh, watch the ball now. He sees the ball, and at the last minute, it's like he's got handcuffs on. See the ball now. Watch it. He'll look up. See him look up. He's protecting his face. Is all he's trying to do. Yes, sir, got him right in the boiler, but he's all right. Uh, no, it wasn't the boiler. What was it? Lavanza. Uh, he got it. The hawk is ready. All the folks down in Alabama, where he's from, happy. The hawk is okay. This is Burleson. Look at those statistics. Seven for thirteen. Time is called. Something I think of. Somebody threw some on a field, frisbee or something. You know, I said this last night about uh, Burleson, Tony. He's one of those guys that just doesn't take that big bite. He keeps nicking you. 
They want Foster to throw it, and he hands it to the ball boy. Burleson just keeps coming at you, coming at you. He did it all year. One ball, one strike. Burleson reminds me a little bit as we look at Evans of a guy who is always one of my favorites, played with the White Sox, was an MVP one year. He always said of Nellie Fox, didn't have much ability, couldn't run, couldn't throw. All he did was hit 320, 30. All he could do was he beat knew, you. He knew how to play the game. That's, That's right. very important in this game. It's something, I'll call it instinct, what you want, but sometimes you can't teach it. Fox went on with that ability to win an MVP one year, 59. Zimmer at third base pretty much the same way. 1-1 one, one pitch. Concepcion's going to have to hustle and makes his play at second base, and they get Evans. He could not have gotten burst. So we go to the bottom of the fifth, 5-4, Red Sox over Cincinnati. A 5-4 ball game, and these Boston Red Sox can put it on the scoreboard, and now to give you the play-by-play -play the rest of the way, voice of the Cincinnati Reds, Marty Brenneman. Thank you, Joe, and hello again, everybody. Well, we've got a pretty much of a carbon copy of what we have witnessed the last two games in the 75 World Series. One-run games, Saturday at Fenway Park, 3-2 Cincinnati. Last night, the Reds pulling it out by a run in 5-4 Boston as the Cincinnati Reds come to bat in the bottom of the fifth inning. Louis Tion will be working to the top of the Reds' batting order as we take a look at this massive crowd at Riverfront Stadium tonight. Rose has had a hit. He scored a run. Has hit the ball hard two times. Dion starts him off with an off-speed pitch that misses the strike zone. Reds got two off of Tion in the first inning. Then he went to work, retired ten batters in a row before the Reds were able to come up with an infield two-out single by Foster in the last inning that started it off. Ball two to Rose. On deck for the Cincinnati Reds is right fielder Ken Griffey. Pitch is foul back. Rose now four for 13 or four for 14 in the games played so far. Louis Tion has allowed the Cincinnati Reds six hits, while Boston, who has continually out hit the Reds, has had 10 hits. Cincinnati trying to battle back from behind after at one point leading 2 nothing before that five-run fourth inning. And Tion, a pitch away from walking, Pete Rose. Rose checking out third base coach Alex Grammas. So Rose opens the fifth inning with a base on balls, and that's the first walk that Tion has allowed tonight. Naked walk number two, Joe Morgan getting a walk in the first inning. Carlton Fisk now going out to the mound to talk with Tion as once again manager Daryl Johnson is going to get some activity going in his bullpen. Well, Marty, when this game started, I remember you said immediately that we look at the bullpen. We got uh, Paul and Burton. Burton's a left-hander. You said if Rose got on, that there was something was going to happen. He did break on the very first pitch. Let's see if it happens now. I'd be surprised if it happened again, Joe. I know Sparky made the comment that they did not even expect Rose to go at all in this series. But we'll see. He's on with a leadoff walk, and now Griffey, who has doubled a run across and bounced to the mound in two tries. Four one. Rose at first base doesn't have much of a lead at all. You can always measure it here in this ballpark by does he get a foot on the artificial surface? Rose does not. Yeah, as really gets off that bag to protect that hole when the pitch is on the way. You got to be careful with Tia. He gets kind of tricky to first. He can surprise a first baseman. Here's a fly ball hit back into deep right field. Looking up as a right fielder Evans, but now will make the catch. Trying to decoy Pete Rose, it looked like, as he sure was. took a glance up as if to make, try and make Rose believe the ball was going to be out of here and then made the catch. He sure did. Pretty shrewd play, which didn't work. He's trying to make it look, as you said, Marty, like the ball's going out of the park. The thing he, I like about that, too, Tony, is after he decoyed, he still got himself in position to make yeah. that good throw. He's thinking all the time. 
Here's Joe Morgan with Rose at first, one out now. The Reds trailing the Red Sox five to four as Cincinnati bats in the bottom of the fifth inning. Beyond perpetual motion out there. Breaking ball is high to Morgan. Rick Burleson, the shortstop for the Red Sox, shading Morgan towards second base. Get a look at the Boston infield defensively. That's trying to get something going in the fifth inning. Throws a walk, a fly ball deep right by Griffey. And here's a man in Morgan you got a pitch to. Peon right around the plate with that pitch, but Joe not having any of it. It's ball two. Yastrzemski with men on first base had some signals with his pitchers whether or not they're going to throw over. At one time he used to flap his glove if he wanted to throw if he thought a man might be going. And the short lead by Pete Rose. Peon needs a strike and he now goes three balls and no strike. Louis throwing a lot of pitches in this ball game. Stan Williams, the Boston pitching coach, is on his way to the mound to talk with Fiat, who has already given up a walk to Pete Rose and is 3 and nothing on Morgan. Marty, earlier in the year, uh, Al is middle of the season on. Tion had back problems, as everybody knows. He also had a mechanical difficulty that Stan Williams, the pitching coach out there now, spotted on their video corner, their instant replay. He wasn't turning his back quite enough, wasn't getting the velocity, losing his control. So maybe he's picked something up. He's upset. Tian is upset, and they're staying there with him to try to settle him down. You saw Carlton Fisk kind of pat him. What you try to do in a thing like that is change the mood, whatever it takes to change the mood, because the pitcher remains the same, but if the mood changes, you got your the man that you want out there. Pitcher is upset with himself. He's not worth very much. Tian taking a little bit extra time as Dan Williams has gone back to the Boston dugout. Left-hander Burton, the right-hander Pole continue throwing as Tion needing a strike. Offers up the 3-0 pitch. Morgan got the green light, and that's something that you will see Sparky Anderson give him at times, but not nearly so much as Daryl Johnson. Dick Pole, the right-hander, Jim Burton, the left-hander, throwing for the Red Sox. Daryl Johnson talking with his pitching coach, Stan Williams. Boston trying to protect the one-run lead. That'll be out of here. So three and two on Joe Morgan. I wonder if he's not relaying the message back to Johnson, the words he got from Tion as to what might have been the matter, if anything. He used to call Williams the big hurt. He is Whoa. so strong, he would come up behind you and grab you by the neck. You might be out for three days. Shake hands with him. Dislocate two, three fingers. So Louis Tion getting ready to throw a big pitch here. Three and two the count. Rose breaking. And it's ball four high. <laughs> Uncharacteristic of Louis Tion. He's given up two walks to the Reds in the fifth inning. Now you head to the power part of the Cincinnati Reds batting order. Daryl Johnson with a decision. Do I stay with my best, the man who's done it for me in clutch situations? Do I go to a bullpen that is young out there right now, Paul and Burton? He's going with experience. Well, here's a guy who has not had a hit in the series. The only regular for either club, Tony Perez, 0 for 11. Has bounced to short, has struck out swinging. Perez 0 for 12 in the series with two men on and one man out. Yeah, strikes him off with a fastball, and he missed with it. Interesting battle going down at first base between Morgan and Yastrzemski. Morgan keeps shuffling his feet, trying to get in the way of the view of Yastrzemski. As the ass moves one way, Morgan looks back, gets in front of him. <laughs> I think he didn't think it all the time. <laughs> oh. Here's a 1-0 to Perez. Swung on and fouled off to the right. That'll be out of play, and it's one ball and one strike. You can see Morgan back up, yeah. as you said, Tony. And the interesting thing about it is it would be if Perez were left-handed. And there's Mrs. Perez watching the game with her. She usually brings her two little boys with her. I'll tell you, that lovely lady always has a smile on her face. The 
Reds with two runs in the fourth inning to make it a one-run affair. And they're trying to really crank it up here against Tion and the Red Sox. 1-1 one, one pitch. Bouncing ball hit by the mound. That could be trouble. Play to first base, and they get the out at first. But Rose advances to third base. Tia with that follow through, following off towards first, has a little dribbler go right by him, and a pretty good play by second baseman Denny Doyle. No chance to get Morgan, as you see. Look where he is on the third base side of second. Fortunately, at Perez, who does not run well. But Tony Perez is ground ball, and he's out 4-3. Doyle to Yaskrimski moves Rose to third base, and Joe Morgan on to second. Here's Johnny Bench. I got to believe I put him on. I got to <laughs> believe I got a better chance of hitting than he has. <laughs> See what happens. First base is open, second and third, two outs. Bench double the run across with a long blast into deep right center in the first inning that hit a fly ball to left in the fourth. So he's had one of the six Going to pitch hits. to him. Going to yep. pitch to him. That's Carefully. Two in scoring position, two down, and strike one is called. He's going to make three pitches on that low outside corner, and if he comes inside, it's got to be to keep him honest. No way that he's going to give him a good ball ahead. It's going to be the worst mistake in the world, and he just doesn't make those kind of mistakes. Miss tying away with that pitch. Bench with three RBIs in the series. Had a home run here last night to get the Reds off and winging. 1-1 one, one delivery high and inside. Joe Tion unusually wild here in the fifth inning. Petroselli at third had come in a couple of steps to shout something over to Louis Tian. Now backing up to his deep position at third base for Johnny Bench. Two one delivery. Swing and a miss and he simply challenged him with a high fastball. Looked like it was out of the strike zone and Bench with base runners in scoring position is widening his strike zone to try to drive in some runs. I think that's not a slugger's grip. Look at the little finger on his left hand over the knob. If he gets any lower, he'll just be having a handful of hands. Bench with a chance to drive in some runs for Cincinnati. He hits a fly ball. Benique has scored the line. And the red threat dies in the fifth inning. No runs, no hits. A couple of men left on. And after five full innings of play, it's the Red Sox five, the Reds four. Play Carroll against Louis Tion. Boston sixth inning, and Tion quickly behind two strikes to Carroll. Backs him out of there with a breaking ball up and in. Tion has been on four times in the two games in which he's pitched. Tonight he has had a walk. He's also single and scored a run. Strike three is called, and plate umpire Dick Stello had to think about that pitch for a moment. That's the second time that he's done that tonight. Louis doesn't like it. It's a curveball that didn't back him out too much. He's on his heels. The speech that he makes here is the speech that all pitchers make as we watch it once again. Yeah, and we almost say, they say, when I'm hitting, you call it a strike. When I'm pitching, you call it a ball. You've but heard it, Tony. Here's a ground ball to third. Rose stumbles, writes himself, and very quickly, two down for the Red Sox. Here's Pete playing way up in front of the bag in case Benicas had attempted to bunt. Pepper Martin. Pepper Martin. In the that? chest, off the shoulder. I kind of believe he might want to get away from those seams, too, Tony. It could be a bad hop. Dennis Menke had one of those around the uh, cutout uh, part, the sliding pit. Now Denny Doyle with two out. He's hitless tonight and three times up, and the first pitch is a ball inside to him. Carroll working his second inning in relief, and he's a third Cincinnati pitcher. Norman Borbone and now Clay Carroll. One ball and one strike. All fouled off to the left. That's out of play. 
Red Sox scored all five of their runs in the fourth inning. Reds with two in the first and two in the fourth. Carroll trying to retire Boston in order. Two down, nobody on. Breaking ball hit up the middle, and that's a base hit. Hit number 11 for the Red Sox as Doyle punches one up the middle with two down to extend the inning for first baseman Carl Yastrzemski. Carroll does you a favor when he throws that thing. That was just a, like a high hanging off speed pitch. Didn't get in a very good spot. Doesn't throw it too often, and I don't know if I'd have thrown it. Of course, it's second guessing with Yastrzemski coming up next. No, I, I think throw my best stuff to the guy that's up right. There. I want to keep those bases clear for this fellow. He has four for 14 in the series. He's had two hits, both singles, a run batted in tonight. Strike call. Red's infield putting somewhat of an overshift on Yastrzemski. Joe Morgan playing deep behind the back white line at second base. Concepcion pulled toward the second base bag and rose well off the line at third. Tony, we talked about Yastrzemski's sock on his left leg having a hole, and he shifted. It's now on his right leg, and it's on the inside. He's going to snap that slump is what he's going to do, that losing streak. See it? There it is. Pulls it foul down the right side. One ball and two strikes. I guess you know, how ball players get like that, huh? I was going to ask. I guess everybody's got a superstition when they play. You count? You have? Did you have one? No. I really didn't. I didn't either. I know Marty does when he broadcasts. <laughs> don't you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. Hank Greenberg had a good one. He liked to touch all the bases when he hit a home run. That's what he said. Well, he has tried to go the other way with a pitch and slaps it foul to left field. Didn't Rizzuto put gum on his cap? I guess on a little button on the top. Yeah. I think he did. I guess the most superstitious of all is Mike Cuellar. Oh, he's got him. Carroll working. Two balls and two strikes. Talked about the Reds infield defensively in the outfield. They are giving Yastrzemski a lot of real estate in left center. Toronto Bow pull well into the gap in right center field and playing him very deeply. Well, Carroll getting two quick outs, but now has run into two out difficulty after giving up the base hit to Doyle. He will be throwing three and two to Carl Yastrzemski. They look like they're trying to force Carl to pull the ball, but that high and inside pitch is a ball that Carl can power to left center field. Did it so well some of his league leading years. Slowly hit ground ball. Perez, he'll shove a line to Carroll who gets there before he has does, and that's all for the Red Sox. Sixth inning, no runs, a hit. They leave one man on, and after five and a half, it's Boston five and Cincinnati four. Defensive change for the Boston Red Sox. Rick Miller has gone into play left field, a left-hander replacing Juan Benicas. But Darrell Johnson going to his bench in hopes of getting a little bit better defensive work out of that left field spot as Miller replaces Benicas, and George Foster will open up the sixth inning for Cincinnati. Five to four score, Boston leading as the Red Sox bid to draw even in the 1975 World Series. Foster won for two, had an infield hit that got the Reds rolling in the fourth inning. Scored two times off Tion in that inning. Louie all set to go to work here. Pitch is missing outside and high. Joe, this is the time of the ball game where you've got to wonder with all the pitches Tion has thrown, running the bases, the pressures he's had in clutch situations, if he's going to tire. We'll watch him closely. Rick, fly ball to left center field. There's Freddie Lynn under and makes a catch. And as Foster leads off the six with a fly ball, the Reds get further activity underway in their bullpen. Young man who has won the two games that Cincinnati has chalked up in this series, Raleigh Eastwick. You know, Tony, watching uh, Tiant work, and just to what you were mentioning before, as Eastwick continues to throw about is he tiring, the one thing you can't measure is the man's heart. You just don't know what competitive fires are in there. You go by past reputation, and brother, you know this guy has got some kind of credentials. 
One down, sixth inning for Cincinnati. Davey Concepcion, the hitter, he had a loop double in the shallow left center field, hit off the end of the bat in the fourth inning. Throw in a run. Shortens up on the bat and takes a breaking pitch. Marty Allen Roth charts every pitch. He tells us that Louis Tion threw 100 pitches in the first five innings. That's a lot. We have Louis getting a new baseball from plate umpire Dick Stello. <laughs> I thought Concepcion was going to hit it for a minute. It was hard to tell. He was asking for a baseball. I come up with a new pitch. <laughs> Check swing foul. A pitch up and in. He was bailing out on it. It's difficult for a pitcher to be considered a team leader. But Tion is by many of his teammates. Even though he's a pitcher, she has only four days of action. Way inside as the ball really rides in on Concepcion. Right. I wonder if that's what Tian was mad about before. He thought some pitches were being missed. He well, he's shaking, he missed his, he's shaking his head right there. Fisk is asking about it. He turned around and said, you call it on Tian when he was hitting. Call it when he's pitching. That's another old catcher speech. Zepsi on ahead on the count, two and one, and he pops it up. Second baseman Doyle going out, but Evans calling for it, two down. Tony, question, is there a difference in the strike zone, American League versus National League? Talked to a lot of players who've gone to both, and they all say that National Leaguers give them the low strikes, give them a little bit more of the outside corner. The American Leaguers give them the high strike. Bobby Mercer told me something interesting this year. He said, I was surprised hearing what I heard that they call more inside and high pitches strikes on them. So you can, depends upon the hitter, the player, I guess. <laughs> and the year Depends upon the umpire. Yeah, the year he's having. Every umpire is a little different. Louis Tion showing signs of getting it together again. He'll be working to Geronimo with two out. Last ball is high and away. Geronimo went the other way and tripled by Benicas. Back in the fourth inning to drive a run in. Last couple of innings, Tion has been awfully tough with men on, especially in scoring position. Breaking ball will be out of play off to the left. Well, you all got a chance here. You know, we see many celebrities. John Gary sang the national anthem. Paul Simon threw out the first ball at Yankee Stadium. And Simon and Garfunkel are being reunited this Saturday night on NBC's Saturday night at 1130 Eastern time. I don't know how you feel, Tony, but Simon and Garfunkel, I mean, that's Ruth and Gary. Where have you gone? Joe DiMaggio. Hmm. San Francisco, I think, at Fisherman's War. <laughs> that's great that they're coming back. You know, the Beatles... Uh, Got back together, and now it's Simon and Garfunkel. We'll get to see him Saturday night. Tion a strike away from ending the inning. He's one and two on Geronimo. The pitcher Clay Carroll is on deck, but we mentioned Eastwick throwing. Trying to go the other way again as he did his last time up and fouls it off to the left. There's Clay Carroll. If Geronimo get on, you can bet that Sparky Anderson will once again go to his bench. Eastwick continuing to throw in the Cincinnati bullpen. Jammed him with a pitch and another foul ball. So Tion continues to throw strikes here. Geronimo wasting him with foul balls. He's throwing him all kinds of strikes too, Marty. Inside, outside, changing speeds. He's working on him. Okay, the one and two pitch again. Oh. Swung on, a looper that'll be in for a base hit. That was a high limb. It was that American Legion high roundhouse curve, and he just couldn't let it get by. No a little bit of the hesitation pitch as Tion stopped with that front foot. A little bit up, and that's what hurt him. He didn't hit it hard. Had it been down, it had been a ground ball. I don't think you could hear that ball hit the bat. He kind of swung it out there like he hit it off his elbow. That was a banana stalk. Sparky Anderson once again going to his bench. There's Daryl Cheney swinging a bat. He's a left-handed hitter. and well, Interesting because Sparky has Danny Dreesen, a most potent hitter on the bench, and a left-handed swinger himself, who obviously is saving for possibly a later time in this game. Probably saving for a man in scoring position. The two outs of factor as Stan Williams comes out to, uh, I guess, go over strategy. Cheney, not known as a power hitter, hit a, had a big day in Chicago with a 
big home run, but he's a spray type hitter. Very quick meeting, Stan Williams with Louis Tiot. Chaney hit 219 during the season, a couple of home runs, and had his best RBI year in the big leagues. All with Cincinnati knocking in 26. First appearance for Cheney in this 1975 World Series, and Tion falls behind to him. Geronimo had 13 stolen bases during the year, caught five times. Cheney with a foul back. It's a ball and one strike. Yaz has gone now, the last pitch anyway, into that fluttering of the glove routine. He has a sign. He doesn't want to break off towards second base to protect that hole and have Tion throw over. It's embarrassing. He's getting a pretty good lead, Tony. He's able to get to the artificial surface, but you doubt that he'd be running, although you can't take it for granted. That's a pretty good lead. Watch your Stremski. One ball, one strike. A two out and a runner at first base. Two balls and one strike to Daryl Cheney. Joe, I wonder if the number of times he flaps those gloves might have something to do with whether he wants it to throw it or not. There's Daryl Johnson. I don't, I would hardly think so because you couldn't ask a pitcher to concentrate so much to count the number of flaps when he's got to get the hitter, Tony. Cheney has been in two other World Series for Cincinnati, 70 and 72, looking for his first hit. He's 0 for 8. Deion draws even at two balls and two strikes. Louie with a lot of different kinds of fastballs. That one he looked like he sunk on him. Came a little bit three quarters. You'll come over the top. It's a riding fastball. You just don't pick up the ball as you mentioned earlier, Joe. Seems to be on you quickly. He hides it so well. He just gives you everything. Elbows, kneecaps, fingernails. He's just a tough pitcher. Well, he goes over to first base for the first time with Geronimo over there. Stremski having to reach back across the runner coming in to take the throw. And that head fake is what made that play. He went up with his head and then quickly wheeled and turned. And Geronimo had to really scamper to get back. Carroll Cheney, pinch hitting here in the sixth inning for pitcher Clay Carroll following Geronimo's two out single. And he struck him out, and that's all for Cincinnati. Right on the target. No runs, one hit in the inning. No errors with a man left on. And after six full, it's the Red Sox five and the Reds four. Here's that last strike. Look at Fisk giving the target. Now watch that ball, how close it gets to that target. Boy, he's got great control. That is a tough pitch to handle, low outside. Fisk gives it to him right there, and he hits it. New Cincinnati pitcher is right-hander Raleigh Eastwick, and this is a young man that Sparky Anderson went to many times during the season, and he has carried over that pattern here in the World Series. Right-hander from Haddonfield, New Jersey, Eastwick 5-3 and three during the season with a 260 earned run average, and as we mentioned earlier, he has already chalked up two victories in the series for the Reds and has a chance to become the first relief pitcher ever to win three games in one World Series. Tied three relief pitchers by winning two. The other is Jesse Barnes of the Giants in 1921, Hugh Casey of the Dodgers in 1947, and most recently Larry Sherry of the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1959. Carlton Fisk leading off the seventh for Boston, who leads in this game five to four. Fisk has had a single, a run scored, and three times up. Eastwick giving up the game tying Homer to Evans in the ninth inning last night and then the Reds coming back to win the game. Here's a pop. Tony Perez waiting. Mr. Bowie Kuhn. Joe Cronin up behind him, Mrs. Cronin, who is an avid baseball fan, obviously, and she keeps the most complicated scorecard I have ever seen. <laughs> she records everything. Probably that question oh, that gentleman she's just getting asked. Corrected. <laughs> Freddie Lynn, first pitch inning, a ground ball to Joe Morgan. 
Two down. Seventh inning for Boston. In the two appearances for Eastwick, he's worked three and two-thirds innings, has allowed a run on four hits. Had 22 saves in 1975 to tie Cardinal relief ace Al Roboski for the National League lead in that department. Petroselli the batter, and it's strike one. Red Sox have out hit the Reds 11 to 7. Each club has committed an error. Boston leading 5 to 4. They came with that good fastball, and I'll tell you, he's got a dandy. He really threw that one hard. He is just firing good old country fastballs. Rounded by the mound, but a routine inning for Raleigh Eastwood. He sets down Fish, Glenn, and Petroselli in order. First one, two, three inning of the game. Reds pitching against Boston in the middle of the seventh, five to four, Red Sox. NBC Sports in the baseball world. That starts it off. We begin coverage of game seven if we have it at 1230. And that's where it begins as far as game seven with the baseball world. If the World Series is completed, then we've got a big doubleheader football game. One o'clock. Baltimore, New England, but Miami and the Jets, Greasy against Namath, 4 o'clock. Oakland plays Cincinnati, and of course, Grandstand will be before and wrapping around all the NFL action. That's next Sunday. If there's a seventh game, we begin at 12.30 with the baseball world. Otherwise, 1 o'clock football, but 12.30 Grandstand. Louis Tiad will work to the top half of the Reds' batting order here in the seventh inning, and Pete Rose with a foul strike on Tiad's first pitch. Rose is single. He's lined to center. He's also had a walk. Darrell Johnson, who has kept the fires burning in his bullpen here in the last few innings, is going with right-hander Dick Drago. One ball and one strike. Rose started to go after the pitch. There's Darrell Johnson. Don Zimmer seated off to his left. Johnny Pesky, his first base coach, to the right. That's Popeye and Needle Nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Disney movie, but by a needle nose. Five to four, the Red Sox. Tion has been at odds with a plate on fire tonight, Dick Stello, and again it appeared that he was not too pleased with a call on that pitch. And he's getting support from Carlton Fisk. Fisk has been jabbering back there, not turning around, but he's getting his two cents worth in, and I tell you, Tion's been around that plate all night. Can't blame him. Rose trying to get on with what would be the tie and run. He hits a shot, but Denny Doyle right in his tracks, and there's one away. Gritty, that's the word for that guy. Here's Rose. Look how close in Fisk is to him, Joe. He's way up underneath him almost. Really is. hard. You know, we talk about not being in agreement and all that, but these umpires, you got to tip your hat. All first time in a World Series. And they umpire that ball under tremendous amount of pressure. Kenny Griffey, the batter, one out in the seventh inning for Cincinnati, and there's Doyle again getting in on the act. Two away. Joe Dick Stallo, the man behind home plate, is actually an instructor at an umpire school. He teaches umpires. Joe Morgan has been on twice. He's both times reached with walks in the first inning, also in the fifth. Fly to left field is only official at bat. Tony, here's your pet play where Petroselli guards the line to third and a lot of room between him and Burleson, and I don't believe that Morgan could hit a ball between him and third. Hardy, I'll bet you haven't seen Joe Morgan hit a ball right down the third baseline all year long, have you? I can't remember him ever doing it this season, Tony. Now, now look at the room he's got. If he dribbles one between short and third. He's giving him the left side of the infield. Two balls and no strikes. That makes it awfully tough on a shortstop because if there is a ball with Morgan's speed hit to his right, he's getting no help from the third baseman. He's not going to get him. There's no way he can get him. And I can't picture a third baseman having to guard the line, guard the line if you got your shortstop way over. Well, Morgan content to wait him out. So as you said, Tiant continually right around that plate. He's not missing by much. 
He's shaking his head. He thought that was a strike. Dion has walked three. He has struck out three. Morgan getting a green light on the 3-0 pitch this time, exactly as he did earlier in the game. Joe very proud of the fact that he can pull any pitcher alive. He even talked the other day about pulling Sandy Koufax. He said, I can get out in front on anybody. Well, Tian has come back to get the count full to him. Talk about Koufax. He was telling a story earlier this season. Somebody brought Koufax's name up under just what you're talking about now, Tony, that he claims he can pull any left-hander, and he said he had a home run off Koufax in the Astrodome to right field. Three two pitch. He hits one and hit it a time. But Freddie Lynn will be there and that's all for the Reds as they are retired in order in the seventh inning. Three up three down. Freddie Lynn making a play on the hard hit ball to deep right center field by Joe Morgan took a step in then broke quickly back on the ball and when all was said and done made it a fairly routine play. So it's three up and three down for the Reds and through seven it's Boston five and Cincinnati four. Eighth inning for the Boston Red Sox, who are trying to hang on and claim a one-run victory over the Cincinnati Reds, and this is the fourth game of the World Series. Dwight Evans, Rick Burleson, and Louis Tiot schedule batters in the inning. Evans has been a very, very important man to this Red Sox club during the season, and very much so in this World Series. He tonight has knocked in two runs with a big triple in that five-run fourth inning. And an infield hit in the fifth. Eastwick with a 1-0 pitch. Got him going after a pitch down and away. Eastwick doesn't get too fancy when he's got that ball behind him, Tony. He kind of goes in with a pretty much a conventional direct route into the grip as far as getting that ball into the glove. Shows I've, never, out of it. Yeah, I've never seen him throw an off-speed pitch. He seems to be power all the way. Pass ball up. That's some of the men from the bullpen. The redhead is Dick Pohl. He warmed up earlier. Diego Segui to his left. Man with a mustache to the left side of your stream is Dick Drago. We might see him tonight if Tiant falters. And there's Louie. I don't know what he's drinking there. Gatorade or something with quick energy in it. Found a youth. <laughs> One and two the count on Evans as he hits one into deep left center field. Geronimo there, one down. Here's a shortstop, Rick Burleson. He also had a run scoring base hit in the fourth inning, a double to left center field, his only hit tonight. What an impressive figure there. 78 times he has struck out in two seasons with this Boston team. Burleson uses that little rubber donut type device in his bat. Some of the uh, players use it who choke up on the bat as he does to give it better grip. Close his eyes. Well, he thought he was going to get hit he by that He thought ball. he was going to get that. He sure did. Whoop. On Zimmer. Leaving the artificial turf on that shot to third. One ball and one strike. Popeye. Cincinnati native. As a fellow knows what it is to get hit. Oof. Two balls and one strike. Eastwick trying to do his job, keep the Red Sox with only five runs on the board and hope that the Reds can come back in their last two at-bats. Rose left side. Two down. Here's Louis Tiot. I'll tell you, they have to respect this guy here at Riverfront Stadium. He put on quite a show at Fenway Park at home Saturday, and, well, he's he's pitched a battling type of game. There's a Boston Red Sox contingent led by Louie's wife. She still had that horn or whatever is going. Talked to a fan that sat near that section, Joe, last night, and they said she was going with it full tilt from beginning until end. <laughs> Grounded. By the mound as Eastwick tried to come up with it with his bare hand. Concepcion makes the play. 
So the Red Sox are up and down in order for the second consecutive inning against right-hander Raleigh Eastwick. And after seven and one half, it remains the Red Sox five, the Reds four. Well, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, World Series game number five. And the baseball world will have Max Patkin. The, now, I guess you could certainly, as inherited from uh, Al Shock, the clown prince of baseball. We'll have Max Patkin on tomorrow night, baseball world in game five. And then Saturday, should this game, uh, well, 12.30 is the starting time. I'd say I think the best thing to do is at 12.30, flip your dial to NBC on the weekends, and you're going to have yourself a big sports afternoon. If Game 7 is around, you're going to have the World Series in football. And if the World Series is over, you're going to have a doubleheader football schedule. And check your local listings. Got some great games up. Greasy against Namath is one of them. And Oakland, what happened to them? Against Cincinnati. So flip it to NBC, and you'll be right there. Well, there's a bit of encouragement for Louis Tion, a sign hanging off the facing of the second deck in left center. Time running out for the Cincinnati Reds in this game. Tony Perez opening up the eighth inning, still looking for his first hit. Strike one call. He's 0 for 13. Perez hoping that 13 number proves to be good luck right now. Look out. Coming straight back and just off to our left. Joe, Joe didn't have time that time to use this formula, which you have not yet heard, but you're going to right now. Catching pop fouls. <laughs> no, no, he's not ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> he's not ready for it. He's got to get some time in the league. Oh, and two the count. <laughs> oh, did you see Louie that time? Well, we got some further business underway in the Cincinnati bullpen. Tion prepares to throw the one and two to Tony oh. Perez. Here's a fly ball hit back into left center field as Miller is there, and there's one down. He dipped on this one. Just watch his head. Now, if you're concentrating on the man's eyes, watch what happens. He's looking at you. Down he goes. Around he goes in the left center field, and here he comes. <laughs> He's amazing, amazing. Johnny Bench with one out. Doubled and three times up as it fly balls twice to left field. Pretty good pitch right there. And a pretty good cut as we take a look at Will McEnany. Mark Anderson has used one of his young lions, Raleigh Eastwick, tonight. Still the Cincinnati pitcher and McEnany working. Pops him foul, but out of play. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Dion has given the Reds only one hit over the last three and one third innings at the single by Geronimo in the sixth inning. Throwing nothing but strikes over the last couple of innings, and he has struck out Johnny Bench. He still had a pretty good fastball left in the arm over the top of the bench. That was a good fastball, Joe. Yes, it was, and the one he threw before him, he even just matched strength against strength. Bench had a good cut, didn't connect, and he came right back, came from over the top and challenged him. I go back to what I said earlier, Tony. I tell you, when you look, if you could look inside a man, you would have a pretty good yardstick. But the credentials this fella has, you know he's got heart. His arm may be tired, but he's still coming at you. Foster with two down as you take a look at Louis T.I. He's had one infield hit. And as per habit, Foster taking a lot of time getting into the batter's box. He's ready, and so too is T.I. There's one single man, I think, fellas, who kept Boston ahead of Baltimore down through the pressure pack situation. It's the guy in the mound right there. He gave them some super ball games, and the first game of the series also a shutout. Strike is called. I'll tell you the way he's pitched against Cincinnati. I think Daryl Johnson would probably like to be able to throw him out there every day. If it goes seven, you know who's going to be on the mound for the Red Sox. <laughs> You're looking at him. Tion taking his time does not appear to be perturbed by Foster's stalling tactics at the plate. Unlike 
number of pitchers around the National League. Two and one. Now it'll be Don Gullick going for the Reds tomorrow night in game number five. He and Tion matched up in the opening game at Fenway on Saturday with Tion pitching the shutout. Well, he gave Sparky Anderson the advantage of giving Gullet that one more day extra rest as Dion pitches on three days rest tonight. Ground ball, base hit. Freddie Lynn up with the ball, quickly back to the infield. As far as we know now, the scheduled pitcher for Daryl Johnson's Red Sox is going to be Bill Lee. Tell you, Tony, a lot of the Reds players felt like Lee pitched a better game against them Sunday than Tion did in pitching the shutout Saturday. He had excellent control, had his breaking stuff going. He held the runners close. Well, the crowd getting caught up here on the base hit to center by Foster. Here's Concepcion. Davey one for three, a double, a knock, and a run. Standing room only at Riverfront Stadium for the second consecutive night. Reds now with eight hits. Boston has had 11. Nobody has scored since the Reds struck for a pair in the fourth inning. Beyond works. 4-1. McEnany still loosening in the Cincinnati bullpen. Get down toward the bottom of the Reds' order. Geronimo, the eighth batter, will be up next. There's a fly ball. That's got a chance. Nope. The right fielder Evans quickly over to make the play. And Concepcion and the Reds are retired at inning number eight. No runs, a hit, one left. And as we go to the ninth, Boston five, Cincinnati four. The preceding announcement was furnished by Major League Baseball. We're in the ninth inning. Eastwick will be pitching to Rick Miller, who makes his first appearance at the plate in this World Series. Miller coming on in the bottom of the sixth inning as a defensive replacement for Juan Benicas in left. Boston 5, Cincinnati 4. Possibility looms of a third straight one-run game among the four that we've had so far. Miller, 194, a batting average during the year. No homers, 15 RBIs. He's a brother-in-law of Carlton Fisk. Ball strike. Miller married to his sister, Janet. Saying a lot, but some consider Miller the best outfielder on this club when you figure Lynn and Evans when Yastrzemski plays out there. Also, he might be the best base runner. Ball of Eastwood. Ball is fouled away. It's two strikes. Seven straight Boston batters have gone down. Eastwick has retired six in a row. Good look at... Well, I guess you could call him a baby-faced Raleigh Eastwood. One ball, two strikes. So are you like me several times during these series games? I've wondered what the difference Jim Rice might have been in this series. Oh, you have to think that. You have to think that. And you have to wonder what's running through his mind. What a disappointment, unfortunately. Here's Morgan playing back behind second and got enough on the throw to get the speedy Rick Miller. One down. So Eastwick continues to roll along as he gets Miller on a bouncing ball to the Reds Gold Glove second baseman Joe Morgan. Marty, is Eastwick the youngster? Uh, I may have him mixed up. Who was quarter saying he doesn't get nervous, but he's got a brother who does all the worrying? He's the one, Joe. He's got a twin brother. And he's the worrier, the yes, twin brother. Yes, not Raleigh. He said that ground ball to second said he has never, ever been worried in athletic competition, ever. And he is most emphatic about it. But when he wants to worry, he calls his brother. Gets him on the telephone. <laughs> Designated worrier. <laughs> DW. The old DW. The old basic DW. Here's a veteran, Carl Yastrzemski, with two out, four for 15. Two hits tonight, including a base hit that knocked in a run. Red Sox bunched him five runs, all of their runs, in one inning and had six of their 11 hits in that fourth. Carlton Fisk is on deck. Oh, a cut by Yastrzemski. 
When he wraps that bat, by that I mean he points that bat towards the pitcher, he gets that cut. Now watch that bat come forward and in the round. Whoop. Boy, if nothing else, Tony, that'll get every bone in your body loose. The old days, you'd pop a button on your shirt. 1-1 one, one the count. It's down low and inside. Two balls and a strike. You know, when guys swing like that behind the plate, you can feel your mask start to come off, the suction, just, <laughs> just like that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You don't believe that. <laughs> Can I tell you about Tian's father who picked the guy off? <laughs> Leesbick has been down and in on the last two pitches. He's three and one on Yastrzemski, who backs away from the plate. Talk about concentration at the bat. One of the great assets any hitter can have. Watch Yastrzemski's concentration. Bouncing ball foul back of the plate. It's three balls and two strikes. He has had some different kinds of years. 40 home run years, league leading years. This year he suffered from the All-Star game out, hit almost 200, but it was due to a bad shoulder. But when it counted, come September, he got some big hits, and we saw the great plays he made earlier in this series. Stays alive with a foul back. We look ahead at the bottom of the ninth for Cincinnati. Geronimo to lead it off, then a pinch hitter for Eastwick, and back to the top for Pete Rose. Talk about the All-Star game, Tony. How about that home run he hit in it? I thought he's the MVP. He got the team back in. I, I'm glad he's Polish. You're probably... No, no, I'm happy he is. I know he is. He's on with a walk. Fifty five thousand six hundred and sixty seven here tonight. As we once again watch Mrs. Louis Tion lead the Boston cheering. <laughs> Louis doing some thinking on the bench right now. He knows who the hitters coming up are. The last of the night for the Reds. Here's Tiot. Here's Carlton Fisk at the plate with two away. Stremski on at first, and strike one is called. The sure. first base runner that the Red Sox have had off of Eastwood. Fisk is single in four times. Concepcion calling for it. Foster behind, David has it, and that's the inning. No runs in the ninth for the Red Sox. No hits, no errors, a man left. Five to four Boston after eight and a half. Louis Tion, three outs away from picking up his second World Series victory of 75 as Sparky Anderson goes to pacing in the Reds' dugout. Joe, you've caught last halves of inning in World Series competition. What's on your mind right now if you're catching Tion? Well, pretty much what you said about who the batters are, what you're going to do, and make sure that you realize that he's still got that good stuff and you don't let your heart, your emotions take over for you. This is where the guts comes in, that if he starts to lose it, you're going to have to tell somebody. Cesar Geronimo will start it off as Jim Burton and Dick Drago, a left-hander and a right-hander, start throwing. Geronimo has had a couple of hits. And here in the background, this crowd wants some action. Swung on, a shot hit down the right field line with a foul ball. The defense is an interesting one to me, Tony. Petroselli at third base is actually guarding the line more. You'll see Petroselli there than uh, Yastrzemski at first base with Geronimo, left-hand batter up there. Does Geronimo buck very much? No, he's not. He does lot, it, Tony. He's not a good butter. A lot of times, a third baseman will guard the line so he has a better angle and a possible bunt. He is extremely overcharged at third base back. Quickly, two strikes out in front. There's Rico. Joe, you talked about a catcher's thoughts last half inning. I know that an infielder, Red Sox infield in this case, has a lot more pressure on him right now than if they were in their own home park. You don't have your last bats. You're a little bit more intense. On deck for Cincinnati, a pinch hitter to hit for Raleigh Eastwick. Young man who's involved in a very controversial play last night at Armbrist. Geronimo, one and two, trying to get on. The Reds trailing by a run in their ninth inning. Foul back. 
mentioned the two pitchers throwing in the Boston bullpen, Burton and Drago. The Reds also have some business underway. It looked almost like he was saying his lips are moving fastball. Here's a pitch. Two balls and two strikes. Did you see that? Yeah. That close up, he looked like his lips said fastball. He had his thoughts go right through his mouth. He doesn't want to go to 3 2, I'll tell you. He wants it to happen right here on 2 2. Well, let's see what happens. Two balls, two strikes. Line drive. Six. They sit the right field for Geronimo. Tony, it appears that Geronimo has been sitting on the off speed pitches of TI tonight. Yeah, right from the start of the game. He's got three or four. He's hit the ball hard today. So there's a tie and run, the Cincinnati Reds dugout. Here's a man who put down the butt that created the controversy last night. Ed Armbrister, little used during the regular season by Sparky Anderson. He's a rookie. Fine runner. And a pretty good runner over at first base in Geronimo. Oh, it begins to get a bit loud at Riverfront Stadium. Here's a pitch, a ball butted foul off the first base side. I wonder what's on the whole plate of part that Stella's mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Stello. A young crew of umpires all in their first World Series. And things are really magnified whether you're playing or umpiring at this stage of the season. Armbrister took a long look down to third base coach Alex Kramer. Petroselli creeping in from third base. Geronimo at first. But, and it's a dandy. Onto Doyle coupling and a fine butt by Armbrister. He did his job. Geronimo on at second base in scoring position. And there it is. Watch Carlton Fisk both out from behind the plate. He has been an excellent butter all year long. Putting at the proper place as Dostrzewski had a hold. The runner, Rico, would have had a better shot. And Armbrister knew it perfectly. It'll bring up Pete Rose with a chance to drive in the tie and run. He's hit the ball three times hard tonight. Once for a base hit in the first inning. Marty, you've got to think once again of the late inning comebacks that Cincinnati has had all year long. Well, T.I. taking a little bit extra time as he goes to rubbing up the baseball. will give us a chance to send along our thanks to our statistician, Alan Roth, our production stage manager, Jim O'Gorman, and our field supervisor, Huey McDermott. One man out. Runner at second base as Geronimo takes his lead. Beyond with a look. Full up. Talk about your competitors, boy. You got two of them going head to head right here. That you have, and you know that in that computer mind of Tian's, he knows what throws will hit the, every time he's been up there. Earlson playing games at second base with Geronimo, and it's two balls in those strikes. Deion, calm, cool, and collected. Dan Williams, the Boston pitching coach. Five to four Red Sox, ninth inning. Rose looking for a pitch to hit at. He changed speeds on Rose, this time nothing but fastballs, fastballs, fastballs. Now Rose is taking a good look at Grandma's Morgan was turned loose. What do you do in this spot? Would you turn him loose, Joe? I think I would, yes. But I'd make sure he'd pick a pitch because he's got the uh, time run over there at second base. It depends on him if he doesn't get over anxious. You've got to know your players. 
Well, let's see what happens. That's a strike, and Rose taken all away. He must be nearing the 200 mark and pitches thrown. He's got to be a tired man, but Joe, you said it so well earlier. What's inside that man? Now we've seen it. We all know what's inside him. One on, one on, three and one on Pete Rose. Geronimo out at second base. Burleson continuing to play games with him. And there's ball four. Yale goes with percentages. He's going with Burton, a youngster. But I'd hate to have, well, I'd like to have the experience of Tion out there. Talk about things pulling in different directions. Which way is Darrell going to go? Well, Darrell is talking to him, and I'm sure the way he gives him the answers is going to decide that he's going to leave him in. Going with his best, even though he might be tired. Burton and Drago. Drago, the right-hander. So the decision has been made by the man who makes them for the Boston Red Sox, Darrell Johnson. Tion will remain in. And the hitter for Cincinnati will be Ken Griffey. Griffey strolls plate where he has had a hit, a double, in the first inning to knock home a run in four times. Geronimo began the inning with a base hit. Armbrister with a sacrifice. And Rose with a base on ball. And I'm standing around this ballpark right now. Louis Tiot, Ken Griffin. Dying run at second. Go ahead, run at first. Speed at second, great speed at the plate, and at first base, and Pete Rowe is a guy who can really bust you up if there's a double play attempt. He'll get a good break off the bag, as Yastrzemski's not holding him on. We've been on first and second. Red threatening and inning number nine. Deion's 1-0 pitch. That's a strike to him. Tony, I know you mentioned that Bill Lee's a probable pitcher. He's down in the bullpen protecting the fellows who are warming up, and he is really a cheerleader when he's down there. See Drago and Burton. One ball, one strike. Ken Griffin, Louis T.I. A five ball, two, two and one. Fisk, as you saw, motioning that he was letting that ball loose high, not following through, just little reminders to try to pull his veteran right-hander through. He is battling. He's got a battle on his hands. A big shot of tobacco in his right jaw. Dodge an acknowledgement of the sign from Fisk. important pitch of this game about to be delivered. He loses Griffey. He'll have the bases loaded. The winning run in scoring position and Morgan at the plate. Boston infield looking for the ground ball. Here comes a 3-1 pitch to Ken Griffey. He bounces first base side, and it's a foul ball. Jazz steps across the line to scoop it up. So Geronimo will head on back to second base. Pete Rose takes a slow walk back to first. This crowd really coming to life, and the noise just increasing with the closeness of the pitch. And yet the concentration, I'm sure, of all the ball players out on that field might as well be playing in the middle of a desert. Look at Sparky. Griffey's going to make Dion wait just a moment before moving back into the batter's box. Veteran right-hander has gone as far as he can with Ken Griffey. Three and two the count. The payoff fit. Fly ball hit well to center field. Lynn racing back. He will make the catch. 
What a catch by Freddie Lynn. Geronimo three quarters of the way down to third. And Fred Lynn has just turned in the defensive play of the game. This is one super play by Freddie Lynn under pressure as he just turns his back. He had a long run. He lopes after the ball with that great style that is already familiar, I'm sure, to all of our viewers. He keeps it to the open side. Not once he turned the wrong way and makes a tremendous play under some kind of pressure. And Geronimo at second base, three quarters of the way down, has to go back. Well, Geronimo, thinking that ball was going to be in there, missed an opportunity to tag and move to third base as the second out is recorded. That's the kind of play you want to tag up on because if, if it does go over his head, you're going to get third and front. You're going to score off his the wall. Speed, his speed, he'll walk and if here. he's on third, you got some chances. With Morgan up, a wild pitch, a ball, a lot of things can happen if you're on third. It's just more pressure for the defense. Here's a man who has not had a good World Series, Joe Morgan, three hits and 13 tries, and he's 0 for 2 tonight, although drove in the winning run last night. He is the last reigning hope for Cincinnati to try and keep the ninth inning going. Deion delivers. Ronimo at second base, Pete Rose at first. Single and a walk got him there. Freddie Lynn with some kind of play on Ken Griffey. There goes Geronimo, pitch has popped up. And that should do it. Yastrzemski and Boston has taken the fourth game of this World Series. In the ninth inning, the Reds' threat goes by the boards as Louis Tion is mobbed by his teammates. The win tonight ensures that it will go back to Fenway Park as they defeat the Reds 5-4, to four, the third consecutive one-run game. Well, the grittiness of the Red Sox show today hanging tough. Louis Tion, a clutch hit, triple by Evans. A big inning when they scored five in the fourth. But the man again is in game number one, Joe, Al Tiante. That's a big story. He'll get all the headlines, and deservedly so, because extra pressure once again is ball club down by one game. And last night's ball game, controversial play. And Tian comes on, and it looked like he was staggering. And yet when he needed it, he really had it. He needed one good play, Tony and uh, Marty. I felt he, the play by uh, Lynn on the ball hit by Griffey was the one big play that he needed. And he got it. And the Boston Red Sox make it two games apiece now. And he is really mild. There is Tony Conigliaro, now a sports broadcaster, talking to Luis Tian. Well, it's tied up at two. We can go to game number five. Bill Lee, the left-hander, he pitched a good second ball game up in Fenway Park, and we'll see Don Gullett, two left-handers. 